Sen, how are you, my brother? Thank you for giving such honor to all of us. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome all of you in this series of webinars I'm organizing as the second vice president of the world, your surgical societies, the WFNS, in collaboration with the Continental Association of African Neurosurgical Societies and the Egyptian Society of Neurological Surgeons. As you all know, we organized previously 35 webinars. We are organizing a webinar each Friday from 12 to 2 p.m. Greenwich time. We also organized seven educational WFNS symposia. Our webinar today is webinar number 36, and it is about modern skull based surgery. We are honored to have uh, our guest speakers, Professor James Evans, he's Professor of Neurosurgery and Otolaryngology, Thomas Jefferson University from the United States of America, and he's past president of the North American Skull Base Society, Professor Basant Mishra, he is chairman of the Department of Neurosurgery, Hinduja National Hospital, Mumbai, India, he is first vice president of the World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies, and he is president of the World Federation of Skull Based Society. Professor Ali Al Mashani is professor of neurosurgery, National Neurosurgical Center, Masqat Oman, and he is president elect of the Pan Arab Neurosurgical Society. And we have Professor, professor Walter Jean, he's chief of neurosurgery. Elehi Valley Health Network, Professor of Neurosurgery at the Morshani College of Medicine from the United States of America. Thanks to all of you for contributing to this neurosurgical activity and for giving us much of your time and experience, sharing your knowledge and experience with young neurosurgeons, especially at this difficult time of COVID-19 pandemic is well appreciated. Uh, we have important topics for today, modern reconstructive techniques in endoscopic pituitary surgery and expanded endonasal surgery, petroclival meningiomas, optimal invasive surgery and current results, supraorbital keyhole surgery for brain tumors and aneurysms, 
mixed reality in skull-based neurosurgery. I'm honored to be contribute uh, to be the moderator of this important uh, webinar. I just uh, got the report of uh, our last webinar, last Friday web webinar number 35. It was WFNS Educational Symposium. We had registrants over Zoom about 562. This in addition to a very good contribution over the YouTube channel and the Facebook page. To all attendees, we are glad to get all your questions and comments, and it will be monitored through the chat panel or the Q&A. We also offer certificates. This is the link uh, through which you can print your certificate, uh, and you are going to put uh, the email by which you are using uh, to register for this activity as username, and this is the password. We are going to send it to your emails, these certificates, one week after the webinar. It's important to announce also about next Friday, we have webinar number 37 about cerebrovascular surgery. We have six eminent uh, faculty, Professor uh, Alan Taylor from South Africa, Jack Moros from United States of America, Ahmed Hagazi from Egypt, Professor Ahmed Ammar from Saudi Arabia, uh, Amir Khorashi is from Kenya, and maybe Sayuk from Senegal. It's also important to announce uh, in, about an important in-person meeting, which is the Third Man's Congress. This is the third Congress of the Mediterranean Association of Neurological Surgeons. It's going to be held in Egypt from 27 to 30 October 2021. Hopefully, if the COVID-19 pandemic will be finished, if still we have problems, we are going to be postponed to next year. Of course, all of you are invited to be our guests and maybe it will be a very good opportunity to celebrate together the ceremony of the opening of the Grand Egyptian Museum. Thank you very much. I think now it is time to shift to our scientific sessions and may I introduce our first speaker, Professor James Evans uh, to start his first talk. Thank you so much, Dr. Alexander, for inviting me and, and allow me to participate in the webinar. It, it's been a very impressive uh, series of, of lectures and, and webinars you've set up, and it's a, it's a great educational opportunity. So I'm very flattered to have you offer um, to have me participate. Thank I'm going to share my, share my screen. Uh, OK. Can you see that OK? Yes, that's good. OK. Uh, so again, my name is Jim Evans, and I'm from Thomas Jefferson University. That's in Philadelphia, uh, Pennsylvania. And I'm going to speak today on the modern reconstructive techniques in pituitary surgery um, and beyond. And it's a, it's a daunting topic. It's a large topic to cover. And I'm going to take an approach that maybe will seem a little more simplistic, uh, but I think important. Um, and often we, we show our greatest case and our most complex, uh, you know, removal of a tumor or reconstruction that we've done. But I think you can look at this as a, as a slightly more simplistic um, angle. And this may be helpful to some of you um, in your practice. This is my university in, uh, in Philadelphia. And this is our cranial base uh, center and my disclosures. And my more important disclosures are that there are many techniques to perform endonasal repair of cranial base defects. There's just way too many to cover you know, in a short time like this. But this presentation is gonna really reflect my personal perspective and experience um, in, in the repair of the cranial base. So these are the pathologies I chose to address and particularly these, the microadenomas, macroadenomas, you know, this is really the, the mainstay, regardless of where you're practicing and if you have a robust endoscopic endonasal practice, um, this is a um, you know, very important part of the practice, right, for all of us. Uh, and even for our more expanded or extended surgery, we often start in this region of the sphenoid sinus and the cella and that sort of thing. So I think it's very important to address repair of, uh, of these, uh, these tumors to begin, and, and then we'll work our way into things that are more complex. So this is just my illustrator's uh, rendition of a pituitary microadenoma. You can see now the dura open and this extra capsular type dissection and on block removal of a tumor like that. <clears throat> and this is how it might look in surgery. 
so this is again the same kind of thing. We were doing an extra capsule dissection and mobilizing around this pseudo capsule and you know separating this tumor in, in more of an on block fashion and then removal like that so we can achieve remission. So a pretty a pretty standard you know kind of operation. And this is my repair for an operation like that. Uh, basically just a sheet of surge cell, sometimes two. When this gets bloody like this, it'll tend to stick in place quite well. Um, it's very stable. Um, it tends to create an environment that uh, promotes growth of mucosa. Um, and it doesn't require other autologous grafts like fat or fascia. It doesn't require any packing. Uh, it doesn't require a lot of expensive synthetic grafts and glues uh, or nasal septal flap, which has its own inherent uh, potential morbidity. Um, so very simple, but very effective. Um, so this is how that would look in surgery for that, that similar operation. And this is basically a simple, straightforward repair, a sheet or two of Surgicel, and that's it. And after surgery, uh, this is how that would look, looking up inside. This is just one week post-op. You'll see we're looking inside, nicely well-preserved turbinates, mucosa's healing, a little hyperemic. You'll see our small defect uh, on this uh, left side of this patient. This is a, an NPL scope done in the office. When you look back inside, you'll see that sort of pulsing a little bit still. It's still kind of healing, a little hyperemic, just one week. But here you look at three weeks, the same exact thing. You'll see the mucosa healing a little bit better now. Um, really uh, just rinsing with saline, no other special treatment. But you'll see that this now looks very stable. It's well mucosalized and pretty stable. And so this can be a very effective uh, repair, but also very cost effective. This is a paper we had published a couple of years ago. We looked at several hundred cases like this. And our leak rate for this was 1.1%. So a very simple, inexpensive, uh, easy repair, heals well in a very limited leak rate, uh, which is, uh, I think, quite good. The caveat is you need to be able to recognize an intraoperative CSF leak. This will not hold back a CSF leak. It's not intended to. So you need to be able to recognize whether you have a leak or not when you're doing the procedure. If you do not, this is a very good repair to use, for, especially for microadenomas and some macros. So let's switch and talk about macroadenomas. So we know that some of these are soft. Um, they, have, they can have a poorly developed pseudocapsule. And we need to have a methodical way of using our binaural approach with our endoscope and working through the resection um, along the floor and, and et cetera, and have a methodical way to get these tumors out and achieve this, where we have a decompressed diaphragm and, and a good removal of the tumor. And that kind of thing would look like this. This is the same kind of opening with the diaphragm coming down. And this is an older picture, but you get the idea. So some of these macroadenomas, as we know, will have a firm or more well-developed pseudocapsule. And this we want to take advantage of, right? Even if we need to do some form of decompression of the tumor, or even if it's only partial uh, pseudocapsule around the tumor, we want to take advantage of it as much as possible and try to achieve a gross total removal preservation of the pituitary gland, yet decompression of the, the optic chiasm. And here's the diaphragm coming down um, in the cartoon. And this is how that might look uh, with an extra capsular dissection um, of a, a similar kind of tumors we saw in those pictures. This is after decompression. We're doing an extra capsular dissection, mobilizing this tumor. You'll see we'll work around. There'll be the normal pituitary gland up on the side here, diaphragm cella above. And as we mobilize this tumor, eventually we can achieve this sort of an on-block removal. Okay, so that's reasonably standard. Here we have our decompressed diaphragm, our gland over top, et cetera. Now we need to fix this somehow. So this is the same case, and you'll see this kind of a macroadenoma, pretty standard. Here you can see as we dissected that tumor off the gland and the diaphragm down here, and then our repair. And, and basically for this kind of thing, it's very similar. If there's no cerebrospinal fluid leakage, and there's no very patchless diaphragm. What that means is this diaphragm that's very loose and you know, very decompressed, it may herniate out of the dural defect and that sort of thing. If these th things are not present, I'll just put a piece of Surgicel or a couple of sheets of Surgicel, no glue, no packing, no nothing. If, however, we have a CSF leak through the diaphragm, or there's a very patchless diaphragm, one that might herniate down and out or could rupture, or if a patient needs CPAP, such as for obstructive sleep apnea, and we'll cover that in a few minutes. Then I do a different kind of repair, <clears throat> which is basically a, a collagen dural substitute. It's an inlay graft that's set under the dura, and then we'll cover that with some biological glue. This may be superflu superfluous, 
probably some blood on here would be adequate, but we do put some glue on top. In this simple repair to take care of this type of a, a patulous or herniated diaphragm is very effective. It doesn't require packing. This is how it would look in surgery. There's a graft underneath the dura and a small amount of biological glue. As you know, this glue will hydrolyze to water um, after a few weeks. This kind of tumor, big obelisks, large tumor looks sort of uh, impressive, but can be well removed. Uh, even these portions that are going out in the cavernous sinus, same kind of simple repair, it doesn't require big nasal septal flaps and, and all kinds of fat packing, and, uh, et cetera. And this can be quite effective. And this is how that would look in surgery, the decompressed diaphragm. You'll see coming in here with that synthetic craft being placed in. Again, this one doesn't have a leak. It's nice to seal all the edges, but this is largely as a buttress to keep the diaphragm from herniating. But if there were a leak, it would be the same thing. We just have to have good approximation with the dural edges and then a small amount of biological glue applied on top. No need for packing. If there's a larger defect and I feel it needs a little bit of support, I may put a single piece of nasopor in here, which will just break down, as you know, to liquid in a week or so. Um, there's no removable packing necessary. And so that's it, simple as that. And now we, um, oh, this is the, the same kind of a case, um, one week uh, post-op, and you'll see, I'm gonna skip up here a little bit. You'll see me look inside, things are pretty well preserved, small opening, et cetera but you'll see that glue just kind of starting to lose its color at a week or so, but things are nicely stable inside without packing and uh, et cetera. And we studied this as well. Um, we looked at a few hundred cases. We published this in 2020, um, our CSF leak rate utilizing this. And these are cases that had intraoperative leaks, et cetera, but our postoperative CSF leak rate is only 1.2%. And many of these were early in the series. We don't see many leaks at all at this point. Um, so this is a very uh, useful, and I think the next tier in repair. This is the same kind of a case. You'll see a large macroadenoma, good removal, simple repair, no packing inside this sphenoid sinus, simple repair at the dura, and you know, large expanded cella uh, with a good removal, but not a very um, aggressive repair. So what about with OSA, obstructive sleep apnea, patients that need uh, CPAP? Um, we studied this as well, and we looked at this in our lab. We created a cadaveric model to study all the, all the different repair techniques and to see how well they can withstand the pressure of CPAP. And it turns out that repair with just that dural graft and some biological glue will withstand 18, 20 or more centimeters of water of CPAP. So it's a very strong repair as well. We actually right now have a prospective clinical trial underway to study this in our patients, both in pituitary and sinus, et cetera. And so stay tuned, but we'll have more information from our clinical trial. So other cellar repair options. Many are familiar with this. Certainly our group at UPMC in Pittsburgh have been leaders in this field for many years. And they came up with this concept of a balloon stabilized graft. This also was an inlay and onlay graft for the dura, also required a, a large fat uh, a buttress or a packing along with fibrin glue. And then this balloon stent, importantly, that they utilized to hold their repair in place. And they would keep this in place for at least five to seven days, sometimes longer, to compress this area. We don't use balloon stents at our hospital at all. And I'll tell you some information about that later in the presentation. But this is a technique that they uh, have utilized at their center reasonably effectively, uh, but does require some addition of a, of a stent in the patient for several days. The gasket seal. Certainly our, our, our colleagues at Cornell uh, with Ted Schwartz and Vijay Anand came up with this concept of using some sort of a rigid buttress, in this case, bone or titanium plate or med pour, uh, and a large graft and sort of countersink or wedge this graft in place to hold uh, uh, their uh, dural graft uh, in place. They cover this with a biological glue and importantly, they use a lumbar drain in every case. So whether that's a fair assessment of the repair alone or is some combination of spinal drainage, spinal fluid drainage, in addition, I don't know the report low rates of uh, leakage. Um, I'm not a big fan of putting a rigid buttress up against my optic nerves or carotid arteries, et cetera. Uh, but for them, this seems to work effectively. So summary of our repair algorithm at uh, Jefferson, uh, surge cell for most of our pituitary adenomas, those that do not have a leak, those that don't have a large patulous diaphragm and the other things I uh, mentioned. Uh, so this is a mainstay for us. If there's a large uh, decompressed diaphragm, one like this that may herniate, uh, we call patulous diaphragm or a spinal fluid leak, then we'll go to our inlay dural substitute and biological glue. 
without the need for packing and other autologous grafts. If there's a large tumor like this with real destruction of the dura, diaphragm is destroyed or open, large dural defects, cisterns open, et cetera, then we'll go to using our button graft, which I'll show you my, my beloved button graft that we've used for many years. This is basically a bilayer repair. Um, they're sutured together with foroneuralon. This is depicting a synthetic repair. We do both synthetic and we can use fasciolata when necessary. And it sits like this in the dura. You can make this autologous as well, as I mentioned. It's a very stable graft. It doubles the surface area for healing, which is important. It conforms to defects with multiple planes, like when you're on the uh, planum sphenodilae, tuberculum cella, et cetera. Um, it can fit very well. It does not require bony edges or a rigid buttress to hold it in place, which I think is important when you use it around these delicate structures, such as the optic nerves, internal carotid artery, et cetera. This has worked very effectively for us. And for this kind of thing, where we have a very large destructive kind of tumor, cisterns will be wide open. There won't be dura or a diaphragm. They'll be opening into the ventricle with direct pressure onto the area of repair. So so-called high flow leak or invasive tumors. Then we'll utilize uh, that button repair plus a nasal septal flap. Nasal septal flap, just a couple of points. I'm sure you're familiar. It's a pedicle. It's based on the sphenopalatine artery pedicle. We use mucoperiosteum and mucopericondrium. And this is really a workhorse for, for more expanded surgery. Just two points I'll make to not belabor it is when you're making this flap, you can come out very wide. You can come all the way up the lateral nasal wall. You can sometimes incorporate portions of the inferior turbinate if you need to. Uh, usually just coming under the inferior turbinate a ways is, is useful and it creates a little bit wider flap. As long as you prepare the mucosal um, uh, site where the graft is going to, the, the, going to be laid, um, a wider flap sometimes sits better than a very narrow flap. If you take this just below the, you know, centimeter below the olfaction and just at the base of the septum, you get a narrow flap. When you put it up, it tends to want to fall away by gravity. A little bit wider flap will sit nicely like a dome and it doesn't require a lot of packing. The other thing we do is we color it purple with a surgical marker. If you color this mucosal surface purple before you harvest it, then you can uh, utilize that to your advantage for orientation purposes when you're gonna set it up at the cranial base. Sometimes the flaps get swollen. Sometimes it's at the end of the day and you may be tired. You may have your fellows or residents or trainees putting up the flap. And this helps for orientation to be sure you don't twist the pedicle. That's not good for the pedicle and it also will not heal if you put it up backwards, I assure you. And so these few tricks may be helpful to you when you're using your uh, nasal septal flap. And this is just a cartoon of the flap going up in place over the primary door repair. So what about if you perforate your flap or you have a laceration? So maybe you had some technical difficulties while you were harvesting the flap. Maybe there's a large septal spur that goes right, to the, right through the flap virtually and you cause some damage. Many people will shy away from using the flap. In fact, if there's a large spur, many centers will take the flap on the other side because it's easier. We at our institution tend to take it on the more difficult side. I'd rather have a laceration because I know I can deal with that than to take it on the good side, on the, on the more easy side, and then tear or injure the side that's left behind that has the nasal septal spur, because then you've got a damage on both sides of the nasal septum. So we take it on the harder side, but we studied this a few years ago. We looked at a series of cases that had a perforation or a laceration when harvesting the nasal septal flap. And it turns out that there is no increase in leak rate if you, set it, if you, if you use it, but it's gotta be positioned correctly. For instance, if you have a hole in your flap, it seems like you want to not put it in the center, but I would put it dead in the center of my dural repair. You leak from the edges of the primary dural repair, not from the center typically. So if you position this well, or if you have a laceration, you've got two portions of your flap. If you position them well so they don't overlie the edges of your primary dural repair, um, then this can heal quite well. And we had no increase in our leak rate, so we're still able to utilize these. And as you know, if you have a tear or a perforation, you can also do endoscopic suturing to close it before you use it if it's a large one. So this still can be utilized. So don't, don't get too worried if you're mobilizing a flap and you have some problem with it. So this is our kind of summary of our algorithm and that, that may be helpful to you. And I think it's a little simplistic, but it's very, I think, effective, uh, both in outcome and effective from a cost standpoint. So there's many classifications for CSF leaks, right? Everybody has their own sort of classification, it seems, and some of them are difficult to understand. They're based on the size of the defect, some are based upon the rate of flow. And I honestly, to this day, I've been doing this for 20 years. I don't understand what flow rate means exactly. Pathology potentially based on the, the type of pathology that may be useful, pituitary tumor or 
intracranial hypertension, et cetera, uh, or a direct or indirect leak, which I think is also somewhat pertinent, whether there's an indirect leak through a diaphragm versus a direct leak from, a spot, from a, an open ventricle that's going to pulse on your repair. So many of these things are important. And this is sort of how I look at it, although this is maybe not the, the final answer to defining these. But I think we all probably agree on the size of the defect, small or large. And then you look at whether the patient has a higher low pressure or a higher normal pressure. So I'll give some examples and try to fit this thing into this sort of high flow concept like this. For instance, someone that has a small defect, normal pressure, like you might have with a pituitary adenoma with a hole in the diaphragm or, or an iatrogenic leak from a functional endoscopic sinus surgery. These will heal nicely. Almost no matter what you do, that they're predictably heal well. Different scenario, small hole, high pressure, like a patient that has a meningoencephalocele. Uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension or pseudotumor cerebri. This is a different animal. We need to pay attention to this high pressure. Is that high flow? Probably that's a, maybe a high flow situation where you see the CSF streaming up because of high pressure, but hard to define. This one, a large defect with normal pressure. This may be the case with our expanded endonasal approaches. When we have a larger opening, maybe like a craniopharyngioma or meningioma, cisterns wide open, ventricle wide open, quote unquote high flow. Is it really high flow? I don't know. It's just a large defect. Um, but we have to take into account and try to, try to categorize these things. So let's switch gears. And we'll talk now about expanded uh, endonasal surgery and some of the more uh, invasive surgeries. The early limitations with this kind of surgery was exactly this. It was the cranial base repair. First, we had to figure out, I guess, if could we get the tumors out. But the big thing that limited us was the repair. And there's about as many collagen grafts and, and biological glues as many types of autographs, free autographs, and pedicle vascularized autographs, right? Nasal septal flap and suturing techniques, which we, we uh, tried for many uh, years and still utilize. Um, and there's probably about as many ways to repair the cranial base as there are centers that do this surgery. It's very, very broad. But when I look at this, I see a common theme for so-called high flow leaks. And that is number one, a primary stable dural repair of some sort, typically covered by mucosa, some vascularized often, but some, some form of mucosa. And this seems to be a common theme with all these different kinds of repairs. Back to our button graft. Again, this has worked very well for us for many, many years. Um, this is, again, a bilayer graft. The inlay is made 25 or 30% larger than the defect. The onlay just slightly larger than the defect. The reason is when I look at my onlay graft, I like to see normal dura around it. Because when I put my vascularized nasal septum up, I'd rather have it vascular tissue against vascular tissue. So nasal septal flap against good dura. And that seems to heal better than if you have bone and all sorts of packing and things in between. Those two tissues heal very quickly together. Um, and this is just an example, of large craniopharyngioma. After removal, you guys have all seen that. This is our fascia lot of harvest, kind of how that works. And we've got an endoscopic way to do this too, but a little incision, an inch or so, inch and a half incision. And um, this is the, the graft you'll see being sutured on the back table. Uh, we do this outside of the nose, but we put our sutures in here and we spread the sutures apart so they about approximate the size of the defect. That'll keep it most stable. And then it'll get put in position. I'll jump, just jump ahead for interest here. There it is, it's sped up a little bit. We color purple for orientation purposes. But here it is being tucked in. The inlay gets put in uh, first and settled. And you can move this graft on the onlay back and forth until the inlay is well settled and unfolded. So you get good approximation with the bilayer repair. When it's settled, you'll see, except for the purple, it'll look and even pulse like dura when it's seated in there. We just get it straightened out and kind of lay it out. And it's as simple as that. And we use these as standalone graphs for many years before we, we used the nasal septal flap back in 2006 and seven. These, these standalone button graphs will heal. And this is just the, root, the nasal septal flap going on top. And we'll put a little biological glue, which is probably the most superfluous part. This blood probably does as good as the glue. And if you need to stabilize the center, maybe a single piece of nasal pore, pretty simple. And uh, this is just the uh, example of a synthetic button going, being put together. And I'll show you just briefly here, um, this kind of concept of, of a synthetic button like this being tucked in place. This is old video and we used to use these even standalone. And you'll see here, once it's, once it's tucked in place, it pulses pretty nicely like dirt. You don't see a lot of leak around it. And this is sort of the, the beginning of this, uh, this uh, graph when we used it. And then this one was covered with the nasal septal flap. 
And so for these giant and recurrent and invasive tumors, uh, these, these may require a little bit more uh, robust repair. Um, we studied this as well. We published this, um, again, with one of your colleagues when he was visiting me, we published this paper a few years ago. And our, our CSF leak, re, um, leak rate, even for these giant tumors, was 1.8%. So it's, it's a very effective repair, I think. Tuberculum cell meningioma, same thing. You see the, the nasal septal flap and our button graft above without a lot of packing. Um, this we published as well in 2018. Craniopharyngiomas, these can be challenging because the cisterns and the ventricle are invariably wide open. Um, this is a lot of pulsation. You're asking a lot of this graft to hold back, but here's a button graft, here's the nasal septal flap, and here's a small piece of nasopore with a, a large uh, craniopharyngioma removal. And these heal very, very well. We studied this. Our early series years ago, when we first published this, was 4%. That was pretty acceptable. Now it's less than 2% because we're not picking up a lot of leaks. And the more cases we get, this gets diluted over time. And so we're actually doing quite well with the craniopharyngiomas. Nasopore, you know, will melt down to liquid in about a week or so. It's nice. It's not doesn't have to be removed. You can just suction it um, after a week. Um, balloon, we're not a big fan of. Um, we've seen patients come to us that have had balloons with mucosal damage, flap ischemia, alar necrosis that required reconstruction, and it can be very painful. So we're not a fan. This can be used at other centers maybe effectively, but we don't, we don't choose to use it. Transclival defect. This was the reason we actually created the button graft, was trying to keep a graft that would not slide down the clivus or mobilize in, on the inlay. It wouldn't fall away on the onlay. This is actually the, the type of defect we created the button for, even though we use it widely today. And this kind of thing, you'll see an extensive uh, chordoma, an intradural component along the basal artery in the pond. You see here on the sagittal view, same thing. This is the illustrator's view of that. And then this is the video. And I won't belabor this too much about the removal. That's not why we're here. Um, but you'll just see this tumor that has extensive dural opening um, along the anterior aspect of the brainstem and uh, here in the interpeduncular fossa. So I'm going to skip ahead a little bit so we don't waste a lot of time with this um, removal. But just to get back to the defect, you'll see there's a large dural defect that the tumor created. We then need to resect more dura to be sure we have clean margins around it. And again, we'll skip ahead. That's, that's resecting the dura. Um, we'll just kind of move along here toward, toward the tail end. So now we get toward the end of the removal, we'll see the basilar artery and the anterior inferior cerebellar and the sixth nerve and all, all the anatomy, here's the basilar artery um, after the removal, but now we're gonna have a defect we need to repair. So we use usually some caliper like a pituitary to measure this defect. So then I can start to fashion my button graft I showed you. This is the graft going in place. You see it begins to pulse like normal dura once it's settled, there's no CSF leaking around it. This is a nasal septal flap going up against that um, primary dural repair just making sure we don't have dead space behind it. You see how nicely seated that is without packing. That's that dome shape, a little bit of glue. And if I need something, like I said, maybe a single piece of nasopore in the center of that, like that. And that's it. And this is the case pre and post-op. Um, you'll see a nice removal of the mass. There's a button graft right here. Sometimes you need a little gel foam and or fat. I don't use fat so much any longer for almost anything, but some gel foam here, just so there's no dead space if it's a very deep clival defect and then our flap kind of coming up over top. And uh, the closure of these, basically this is a cartoon here, or uh, illustration, or uh, just showing on, a, on an image, how we have a bilayer repair in the dura. Um, this is our button graft I spoke about. Sometimes you need gel foam or fat in a dead space. It's a very deep defect, depending on the, the length of your uh, nasal septal flap, if it's a child or an adult. And then you'll see this nasal septal flap will go in position about like that. And this repair has been very effective for us. And again, this is the reason we developed the button graft in the first place. Um, lumbar drains. So this is another controversy, I would say. Um, you know, does it reduce leakage after uh, these cranial base repairs? Um, the Pittsburgh group, again, uh, did a uh, study on this a prospective randomized trial looking at their own cases. And they found that their leak rate for expanded cases went down from 20 something percent down to 8% or so with the use of a lumbar drain. So for them, this may be effective or, or a necessary part of the repair. It certainly seems to have helped in their study. We don't use lumbar drains for anything. Primary repair, or if a patient comes back with a leak, we tend to go back and just fix the leak. I think when it's repaired well, um, this is not necessary. As we know, lumbar drains can have their own inherent morbidity as well. Um, so we don't rely on them. Other repair options, just briefly, and then I'll finish up. Temporoparietal fascia is an important workhorse. 
pericranium, and vascularized free flaps. So T TPF or temporal parietal flap is, is a very familiar flap to most of your head and neck surgeons. Um, it's used for many extracranial reconstructions, such as microtia repair for the ear, <clears throat> static facial swings, often temporal bone defects. This is a very useful flap. It's contiguous with the SMAS and the, the galea, and it's pedicled off of these uh, superficial temporal arteries. You can see here, this is the superficial temporal artery going into it. Uh, often, you know, it's going to require an external incision, et cetera. Uh, but this is a very versatile flap. It's got many advantages. It's constant. It's a very constant anatomy. It's got a great arc of rotation as far as flaps are concerned. You can reach vast areas with this flap. It's got a super long pedicle, which is useful. It's a highly vascularized tissue. It's very resistant to infection. It's easy and pliable to, 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 uh, to conform to, to different uh, shapes. And the really important thing about this is it can provide um, multi-layer uh, coverage and you can actually fold this up. You can wrap it around an artery or around a structure. You can fold it to make it thicker. You can pack it in areas. It doesn't have to, unlike a nasal septal flap, it doesn't have a surface that's got to be exposed or, or that sort of thing. So it's very useful and it can be, um, you know, uh, a very effective repair. It's got some disadvantages. I mean, you need an external incision. So you have a coronal incision to get a visible scar in some patients. Um, potential for alopecia. You're taking tissue that's right under the galea. They can lose hair. You've got to watch your frontal branch for the frontalis policy, et cetera. Uh, but it is a very useful flap. Now, we studied this in our lab a couple of years ago, and we did many morphometric uh, measurements and tried to sort out the ideal size of the graft necessary for various repairs, various size and location repairs. And I won't belabor this, but you can look at our paper and maybe a guide to you if you need to utilize a, a, a temporoparietal fascial flap. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the pericranial uh, flap. So this is um, a useful flap uh, that we haven't had to utilize too often, but this was published by Zenation and the group from Pittsburgh, and they were trying to perform an endoscopic harvest of this flap. Now, we've all worked with that, and it's not so useful. It's a very difficult thing to do because of the curvature of the skull, et cetera. And if you want a really robust flap, most of us have gone to making the coronal incision again. You can pedal kill this uh, uh, unilaterally. They all require a glabella, uh, some drilling at the glabella to pass it into the nasal cavity. You'll see here before, before passing it through. But this can be effective. It's a pretty vascularized tissue, as you know. Most surgeons are familiar with it, and uh, neurosurgeons. And um, it can be useful for the anterior cranial base defects as a backup plan. You can get a pretty good length out of it uh, as well in a reasonable width. So this is another one. And then this kind of thing. Um, this is a, a free flap repair. I'll just talk briefly about these. This is a patient that had nasopharyngeal carcinoma uh, with osteoradionecrosis. This patient had prior surgery and radiation for a, a, a very large nasopharyngeal carcinoma, had a prior right-sided craniotomy, already had a utilized left-sided temporoparietal flap as part of the repair and then developed a delayed, and we're seeing this more frequently today, so heads up, but we're seeing a delayed radionecrosis from these cases that get large uh, doses of radiation. Um, and so we needed some way to repair this cranial base. You can see it's eroding the clivus. It's got exposure of the internal carotid artery. We chose to use a radial forearm uh, free flap. It's got a very long pedicle. Uh, it can create a great arc of rotation as well. So we insert this through a Caldwell lock incision. In this case, we were trying to use angular branches that were not uh, adequate because of her prior treatment, we ended up using the facial artery and vein. But because of this very long pedicle, um, it's, it, it lends itself well to getting vessels at a distance. That's sometimes very important. And you can see here this flap in place. This is the pre and this is the post, a very nice flap sitting in place. Uh, after we take away um, the um, non-vital bone from the cranial base, this graft really augments that healing because it brings new vascularized tissue in place and can help. This graft will shrink a little bit, probably about 20 to 30% over some time, but it's situated nicely. It's got a good vascular uh, blood supply. And this, this uh, solved the problem for the patient. So remember your, your uh, free flap colleagues work closely with them. Um, there's a, a number of flaps we utilize from various parts of the, of the body. And if you get in a jam and you don't have enough local regional flap or tissue that you can bring free flaps in place very effectively. So I'll stop there. I want to thank you for inviting me to present. I'm happy to discuss anything or answer any questions um, that you have and, and, and really appreciate your, your allowing me to be involved with the webinar today. So thanks so much. Thank you very much for this great presentation, James. 
really it's a fantastic talk and we enjoyed your talk so much uh, and uh, i uh, we have discussion after the second speaker i think we are going uh, to be with us until we finish this uh, first session um I, uh i'll try i'm sorry i'm about to start an operation on a child uh, in a few minutes for a large rhabdomyosarcoma so i'll, I'll try to hold on as Thank much you. as i can um I might uh, I, we, we, we have james we have many questions in the panel for you and uh, and uh, and we need that you to discuss it if possible but uh, actually we have the discussion after uh, professor yeah. basant mishra and so and so after the second talk we open panel discussion okay thank you th 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 thank you very much for this great presentation now i am honored to introduce uh, professor basant mishra uh, he is well known uh, skull based neurosurgeon uh, all over the world i don't think he needs any introduction he is chairman of the uh, department of neurosurgery at hinduja national hospital from mumbai india he is uh, first vice president of the world federation of neurosurgical societies and he's president of the World Federation of Skull Base Society. Basant, are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Thank you very much, Nazir. Uh, good to see you, and thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, very nice webinar. Beautiful, very comprehensive talk by uh, Professor Ivans. I really enjoyed James. It was a beautiful talk, and it, it, it caters to both the beginner and, and the you know the man who's doing every day. So. Thank you very much for we really you. appreciate uh, your talk. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, let me see if I can. Are you seeing my screen, Nasser? Yes, yes, perfect. Okay, thank you very much again, Nasser. Uh, you've been doing a tremendous work. I think you are probably doing the maximum number of education programs in the world today. Yes, I don't know about other right. departments, but in neurosurgery, definitely yes. That's right. Please. Thank you, and we are grateful for the contribution you are doing for education. Thank so you, Wilson. Be here, uh, and let me see if I can share with you some of my thoughts about the management of petrochlebal meningioma, which is something which is very close to my heart for a very, very long time. And so, thank you again. So. For the young neurosurgeon, petrochlebal meningioma, one has to be very careful to define it. It's a meningioma which arises from the upper two thirds of the clivus and the petrochlebal junction. And this was by Professor Yasagil and Professor Al Mifti added to that the tumor has to have an attachment medial to the trigeminal nerve. And that's very appropriate because the tumor lateral to the trigeminal nerve attachment is easier than something which is attachment medial to the trigeminal. So it's important to define what we're talking about. And this consists of about posterior fossa 10% and PCM 10% of the posterior fossa meningiomas. They can be of various type. They could be calcified, they could be soft, they could, could uh, the, the vessels could be inside. Sometimes it could be easy. Sometimes the whole day may not be sufficient to take out a tumor. So what are the issues we are talking about petrochlebal meningioma, whether you excise totally or subtotally? If you want to excise it, what approach? You're going for radio surgery. If so, yes or no. And whether it is up, up front or adjunct. And if you're doing it, well, what timing? And sometimes whether to treat it at all or not. So we'll give you some examples. So, so which ones are we talking about? So we're talking about tumors like this. These are slides from more than 25 years back in my practice. Uh, one patient, this is pre and post. This is another one pre and post. Most of my patients of petrochlebal meningioma, more than two decades back, were operated through classical uh, dedicated skull base approach. But we have moved on. There has been a change in practice. But first to emphasize that this is not a petrochlebal meningioma. This is a petrous apex meningioma, much easier. Uh, animal than a petrochlebal meningioma. There is no attachment medial to the uh, to the trigeminal nerve. And these are easy tumors which should be excised completely and there is no need for any adjunct treatment. And this can be done through a simple retrosegment approach. We are talking of tumors like this. You know, tumor which has attachment medial to the, uh, to the uh, trigeminal nerve. But even a tumor like this, which I was doing usually through a petrosal approach about 25, 30 years back, most of these tumors we do through a retrosig approach, as you can see that we have to operate between the cranial nerves. You see that, but that is what we are trained for. So we need to get training to be 
able to operate without damaging the cranial nerves and we take it out in piecemeal and you can see at the end of the surgery, if you can see that arachnoid, that's a very good sign. That's of course the sixth nerve, the seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth. And you can see uh, that that's actually the fifth nerve. That is that is the third nerve beyond that. You can see beyond in the supratentorial compartment, that's the third nerve. And that is the, that is the fifth nerve here. Uh, if you see this arachnoid at the end of surgery, that means we have not damaged. It's a very good sign for the skull based surgeon. And you have a full total excision, like you can see, without any uh, deficit of in the cranial nerves. A tumor like this, a spinopetroclival meningioma with middle fossa extension, the huge tumor going across up to the midline. What approach? Now we always uh, tell the patient that we may need two approaches. I would rather sit there for five, ten hours rather than twenty hours today. Maybe when I was twenty-five years younger, I used to sit there for fifteen, twenty hours. I don't do that anymore. I would stage it. That's what the patients will advise. We'll go for a retrosig approach first, and if it is necessary, we'll come back for a second stage here. But because the patient tumor was soft, and that's the nerve getting stimulated, and there was no pile bridge, we could remove the tumor completely, uh, the, even the, the middle fossa component, component through the, uh, the retrosig approach, as you will see there. The whole tumor could be removed without damaging the patient, and that is the tumor in the supratentorial compartment. There is no attachment, so we could remove without uh, damaging the patient. And that's the patient before discharge. You can see the retrosic craniotomy, uh, simple retrosic craniotomy and total excision of the tumor. This almost now 12 years post-surgery and there's no recurrence, no adjunct treatment necessary. But tumor like this, a little more central and more fibrous and solid tumor, uh, we do still a, a retrosig approach, but we need to do some extra maneuver like what is called supramietal drilling, which was popularized by Professor Sami. A tumor like this, still you can remove the middle fossa component through a retrosig approach and by drilling the petrous apex uh, in the supramietal area that you can see the pre and post op MRI without any damage to the brain stem. Again, similar tumor, uh, the uh, very central tumor, the brainstem is completely squashed. Posteriorly, you see the tumor in the, this is the midline, mid sagittal, uh, the MRI, you can see very st uh, strong compression of the, uh, the brainstem, the midbrain. Again, you can do the retrosig approach, but a tumor like this is much better to operate it through a semi-sitting position uh, uh, because the gravity helps us. We can almost take out the tumor without using a retractor as was done in this particular patient. It's an incision like we do sometimes uh, the, for a, 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 the supracerebellar approach. Uh, it's called a lateral supracerebellar approach, which I quite often use for tumors like this. And that's the tentorium and that's above the cerebellum. There is no retractor. The gravity helps is a decompression of the tumor and you can see at the end of surgery, that's I think the, the probably the fifth nerve. Uh, there's some vessels there and we have, we have been able to take out the complete tumor, uh, which is very centrally located, huge tumor uh, through a retrosig approach. Again, more often than not, the tumor decides whether you can have a complete excision. If there is a pile bridge at the end of the surgery, you can see cerebellum very lax and that's the dural incision. Uh, which is a supracerebellar retro plus a retrosig approach, and you can achieve a total excision as was done in this particular patient. What about a tumor very high up in the clivus? And this is a young man who presented with, to us with headache and visual compromise. You can see the whole circle of Willis is inside the tumor. We are very concerned because the patient had hardly any deficit other than uh, other than a visual cover by uh, the the uh, field effect and otherwise completely intact. So we're quite concerned. But again, it depends on what the tumor is. And here we use a little bit of a simple uh, skull base, uh, OZ approach, and we do an extra dural anteroclinectomy. Uh, and that gives us that extra space to go high up without doing much of a retraction of the brain because retraction is the one which causes damage to the patient, most more often than not. So extradural anteroclinectomy we often use for tumors like this, was done this particular patient. And then we wide opening of the sylvian fissure. So we do not have to retract the brain very much. Very, very wide opening of the sylvian fissure, CSF drainage. 
and then decompress first attachment with devascularized tumor. Again, there you see there is no retractor there. We are taking out the tumor without a retractor very high up in the clivus. All the vessels are inside, but we could take this out without damaging the patient because there was no prior bile bridge. The adventitia of the vessels were free, so we could dissect that out. And of course, this takes time, but we can do that without damaging the patient. And that's at the end of the surgery. You can see the basal artery and that arachnoid there the basilar bifurcation, and this is such a beautiful site at the end of surgery that we have not damaged the patient. And that's the post-op. Again, this is many, many years now. This was operated in 2013. So now it is eight years now post-op without any uh, recurrence or adjunct treatment. So what about always trying to remove the tumor completely. We don't need to do that, neither we can able to do it. And now this is a lady actually from my uh, uh, neighboring country, Pakistan, who had this tumor, who one neurosurgeon had gone in there, but there was some, uh, there was, this was post-stop actually. This is one operation has been done outside, but they, they had to back out because of bleeding. And this was taken out in two stages. And then we give the gamma knife for uh, for the residual tumor in the cavernous sinus, because the patient is very difficult nowadays to come back from Pakistan for treatment. Uh, you could probably observe if it is available, but otherwise this is how it was done. Uh, this is actually a patient from Oman. This is a lady who we, I think we operated in 2001, sphenopetroclival meningioma. The whole uh, systonal component of the tumor was removed. Again, the patient was from a foreign country. It's not easy to follow up. Uh, and she opted for uh, upfront gamma knife for the tumor in the cavernous sinus. It is absolutely appropriate to follow it up and go, go for radio surgery if there is, there is a growth, and that's absolutely fine, provided the follow up is not suspect. And of course, you need to discuss with the patient, and this is what the patient, uh, patient uh, wanted, so we did it. And um, I see uh, Professor Al uh, Swani, he's there from o Oman. And one of their meetings, I had gone there after 10 years. And where I saw this patient, she came to the meeting and she was still intact. And the tumor has remained uh, uh, well controlled. Now, this is a young lady uh, of Indian origin who is in UK. And this is a huge tumor uh, which she had. We, we operated through a retrosig approach again. Uh, and there was this tumor which had a pile bridge. And every time I was taking it, trying to remove, there was the, the seventh nerve was beeping. And so we had to leave some tumor. Again, we have not done any adjunct treatment. We are following it up because the, the follow-up is not, not suspect. Her husband is a doctor, so I know I'm not going to lose this patient for a big, big recurrence. Uh, before that, we could pick it up. And if there is a growth, we will go for some adjunct gamma knife radio surgery. Now, tumor like this, this is a gentleman in his late 50s who presented to us in 2000 with this tumor going into the middle fossa, the basal inside the tumor. But this is the critical image, the T2, this irregular outline, brainstem edema. That should have told us not to attempt total excision, which we did, and that was a mistake. And we tried to remove the tumor even after two-stage surgery, translab and OC, we did not remove the tumor. There was a subtotal excision, but there was a brainstem damage, you can see here, and the patient was significantly uh, compromised for a, for a, it took about one and a half years uh, for him to be independent. Fortunately, the, he is active now and he's working, but he remains with a minimal hemiparesis on one side. So today, a tumor like this, we would electively go for subtotal excision. I would not attempt a total excision. If I see this, a irregular outline on a T2 image, and all tell my all my resident be very very cautious about taking out this tumor. A tumor like this, this is 70 plus lady with atypical facial pain, arm plaque tumor, not a big volume, uh, but no other thing other than atypical facial pain. So I knew that if I tried to remove this tumor, I would probably produce some compromise at least of the cranial nerves. And again, there is the dura, bone, everything is involved. I will probably not achieve a grade, uh, uh, the, the, uh, grade one or grade two excision. So we opted for uh, primary gamma knife. And fortunately for us, the patient was pain-free, but the pain-free rate is not very great. It's about 50 to 60% for atypical facial pain for primary gamma knife. So we are not a good, big fan of primary gamma knife, but we do sometimes do that. 
Now, this is a, a gentleman in his 60s who presented uh, with this tumor uh, in 1996 to me. Now, you can see he had a right sixth nerve paresis, and that's about it, nothing else. And so we advised surgery. He ran away, not uncommon in my country, to come back after 10 years with a swelling in the forehead. And the tumor had grown, but patient's deficit was nothing more than right sixth nerve. He had no other complaints. He had no diplopia because that has become a lazy eye. And the only thing he had, he had a swelling. And it was 10 years, 1997, uh, 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 96, he presented first. And then 2006, he came back uh, with this, uh, with this uh, uh, swelling. So we didn't know what was it. We put in a needle. This was a tubercular abscess. And uh, so we, this was treated by anti-tubercular treatment. He went back home and he died after one year of that. So 11 years after the diagnosis, when I advised treatment, which he did not do, he was right, I was wrong. He died of a myocardial infarction, not because of this tumor. So one has to be very careful to advise treatment. Because some of these tumors may be very, very indolent, very, very slow growing. The natural history, one has to be very careful. This is another young lady much younger lady in her uh, early 30s who was a physical instruction teacher and she had intermittent uh, hoarseness of the voice at the end of the day. And he was evaluated extensively by the ENT till some neurologist asked for MRI, which picked up this extensive tumor from infratemporal fossa right up to the pitreous apex, extensively heavily calcified solid form uh, T2 dark tumor and he came to me, uh, I said, if I do something, I'm going to damage you. I can't take out the whole tumor. I'm going to cause you more damage than what you have now. So we would follow up. So now it is about seven year follow up. The tumor remains stable. The patient has ninth, 10th paresis, but is not compromised. She can swallow. Uh, her voice is worse and that's about it. We are following it up. She'll probably have problem because she's much younger, but I, we did not produce a problem. If I had gone in that time, I would have probably produced problem and patient would have had the residual tumor anyway. So these were my trends of surgical approach. And this was, uh, we put it in Professor Almepti's book, as you see, before 97, majority of our patients had a dedicated skull base approach. Whereas after that, we had a gamma knife available, a majority of patients were being operated through a simple retrosig approach. And this was in Professor Almepti's book of controversies of neurosurgery, the chapter was said by me and Dr. Almepti. Now, this is, we have published very recently in February 26, uh, this is February 26, 2021, our results in the 21st century. And this is 72 cases of conjugative cases of petroclival meningioma which were uh, operated by us. And uh, this is the, uh, the R series, you can see that. Uh, and we have a cranial nerve deficit now about 20%. We haven't lost any patients uh, in the new millennium. And we have achieved a gross total resection of about 42%. I had a series which I published in 2006. We had a, we had a, a much higher uh, you know, kind of excision rate, which is much lower now. But our uh, the cranial nerve uh, control rate and the functional uh, the functional outcome has been much better, and that's the that is what we have accepted. So we don't want a we want a good patient rather than a good MRI today, as many other skull based surgeons have learned over a period of time. So this is our uh, protocol for microsurgery approach, depending on the location of the tumor. Now, if it is a posture for alone and is a useful urine. Hearing, we usually, most of the time, we're using a retrosig approach, or sometimes <clears throat> a, a more central tumor we would do, or a small tumor, paradoxically, a small or a hard tumor, more central, we will go for a transpetrosal approach. A large tumor, we will go for a retroscape. A non-useful hearing and more central tumor, we go for a transpetrosal approach. If the tumor is both in the posterior and middle fossa, if it is extending below internotary canal, Either we do a retrosig plus a orbitozygomatic that is more common today than a combined transpetrosal, which was more often we were using in the past. And the tumor is only above the internotary canal and the, in the, in the petroclaval meningioma, we would do an anterior transpetrosal approach and take out the tumor. <clears throat> so uh, in the new millennium, this is the way we have operated in the 72 cases. As you can see, majority have been operated through a retrosig approach, though we have used other, uh, other uh, uh, dedicated skull-based approaches in many of these cases. 
uh, our results as we compare, uh, fortunately, we have improved, we have learned, and we have tried to tailor the procedure depending on the patient's condition and whether there is a, uh, there is a pile breach, what is the, the uh, consistency of the tumor, what is the natural history of the tumor, and we do not hesitate to leave small bits of tumor and to achieve good function. So you can see that we did not have any mortality. Our uh, motor and deficit has been much less as also the cranial nerve deficit in the new millennium. Uh, so current protocol, if you have brainstem symptoms in a patient in India, as in many countries in our region, the patient presents very late, they have very large tumors. So they have many more often than not, they have brainstem symptoms. And if that is so, then we go for surgery. If there is a cavernous sinus involvement, uh, then we go for a subtotal excision and either we follow up if the follow up is not suspect and on growth we do gamma knife radio surgery. If this uh, follow up is suspect, then we do upfront radio surgery for these symptomatic large tumors. Because if the patients have a symptomatic large tumor or a giant tumor, they are more often likely to have recurrence than a small tumor uh, when we to start off with. Now, there is no cavernous sinus involvement and there is a good subarachnoid plane. There is no plane pile breach. We would attempt a good uh, gross total excision. And if the pile breach is uh, there, then we go for subtotal excision plus radio surgery if it is a giant to a tumor or a symptomatic tumor to start with. Otherwise, we follow up and observe and give gamma knife for growth. As far as the age is concerned and the patient has no brainstem symptoms, if the patient is elderly, uh, then we would give a period of observation to see if the tumor is growing before we advise and treatment. In a younger patient, we would advise surgery if it's a large tumor. And similarly, in the cavernous sinus involvement, uh, it goes in the same paradigm as before. What about uh, gamma knife? It is always elective. It is stays. Uh, if it is difficult to follow up, we give um, uh, up, up front gamma knife or there is a very short history. Patient temporal course of the disease is short. Patient is has a giant tumor. We would, of course, go for uh, upfront gamma knife. Otherwise, on recurrence. So this could be various types. The, the petroclival meningioma sometimes looks very ugly. You can take it out. Looks not so bad, but you cannot take out. So we have to tailor the approach depending on what the tumor is at the time of surgery. To summarize, some but not all should be totally excised. Petrosigmoid approach is appropriate in majority of the petroclival meningiomas in our practice. However, dedicated skull-based approach is essential and the young neurosurgeon must be familiar with all these approaches and the tumor should dictate approach rather than your limitation. Today, we would, as I said, stay surgery rather than which I was more often doing single stay surgery, maybe 20, 30 years back. I don't do that anymore because we are all human beings. We do get tired and the last part of the tumor is the most difficult part where at the end of the day, I would rather come back with a second stage. Radio surgery, we feel, is a huge full adjunct, which could be either upfront, depending on the availability, the follow-up, the patient is, uh, can be available for follow-up, then you can follow up. If the patient has a large symptomatic tumor to start off with and the temporal course of this history is short, I would go for upfront gamma knife. Uh, so our philosophy is radical but safe excision. The final slide. For the young neurosurgeon, remember your complications. Remember your mistakes, as I showed you some of mine. And that's the only way we do not repeat it. Uh, and if you cannot do like what everybody wants to, you to do, don't follow blindly. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Basant Mishra, for this very great presentation. Great as usual. Thank you very much. Uh, we have very good uh, presentations today. And now we open discussions. Uh, I'm happy to introduce uh, Professor Omar Youssef. Uh, he is a uh, moderator of this session with me, Professor of Neurosurgery at Ain Shams University. Omar, are you here? Uh, thank you, Dr. Nasser. Thank you, Dr. James and Dr. Mishra, for these great presentations. Actually, you have uh, a lot of questions uh, on uh, these uh, those great presentations. The first question to Dr. James uh, about the uh, cellular repair for microadenoma. 
uh, does it uh, done for all cases or only when you uh, you expose for CSF leak? Uh, Dr. James? Uh, so I'm not sure I entirely understand the question, but maybe a few comments I can try to answer it. So for a microadenoma, if there's no leak, you, you could probably literally just leave the dura open. And in some cases, if there was a lot of hemorrhage or you think something may be oozing, you could. But I typically do a repair for them all, if, if I'm answering the question correctly, uh, but simple repair with just Surgicel. If there's a CSF leak, that's a different story, as, as we discussed. And um, you know, sometimes we need to be a little bit more aggressive with the repair, I mean, with the resection for a functional tumor. You know, it may require us to do a lot of work on the cavernous sinus or a lot of work on the diaphragm. And sometimes the leak rate for that kind of tumor can be greater than it is for those really giant macroadenomas where the diaphragm is just nicely displaced. And so um, if there's a CSF leak, by all means, then I do a repair. Um, the the, the surgical cell, as I mentioned, will not hold back a CSF leak. So you need to identify whether you've got a leak or not. Um, but I, I mean, I hope that sort of answers the question, but the idea is, yes, I do repair. I tend to use just surge itself for the majority of those cases. If there is a CSF leak, then I need to escalate my repair as you saw in the algorithm. Uh, and the, and the, what's the condition uh, if you, uh, you are operating on a large macroadenoma, but you, didn't, you, you don't expose for CSF leak? Is it the, the routine to do in lay on lay or just when you uh, exposed for CSF leak only. Uh, again, just to reiterate, so you're, you're asking when I have a, a large pituitary macroadenoma, but no CSF leak? Yes. Okay. So it depends upon the diaphragm in that case. <clears throat> if the diaphragm is significantly decompressed, you know, some of them are thick and they don't just sort of fall down and some will be super thin. You can almost see through them um, and it's going to herniate, oops, excuse me, it's going to herniate down and, 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 and maybe out of the, the dural defect. You know, we've seen that kind of thing in the past where that diaphragm will herniate out and literally rupture or, or get snagged on a small sharp area of bone in the sphenoid. And um, with that scenario, even without a leak, I would do a repair. And I would put an inlay rigid dural graft um, as I had shown and some biological glue alone. But I don't need to pack or do other things like that. Uh, so if the diaphragm looks like it may herniate out, I would absolutely repair that um, just with something structural to keep it from herniating. Uh, another question for you, Dr. James. Uh, do you use the Vazalva after tumor excision to see the CSF leak? And do you use the lumbar drains also or not? That's a great question. So I, I just will address them each. So, so Valsalva, um, I really don't rely on that for, for, to look for a leak. Uh, I think you need to be able to identify a leak by looking. Um, you can often tell if there's a little bit of blood, you'll see that sort of dark of the CSF going through. We, we talk about oil and a sea of red kind of thing. Um, so usually you can identify it. I'm not a big fan of utilizing a Valsalva maneuver to do so. I find you can sort of create bleeding and other problems when you do. Often the patients end up coughing like crazy. You know, people tend to do a repair after say like a, a craniofringoma or that sort of thing. Valsalva to see if it's working and then the patient's bucking and coughing and their, their blood pressure is going up. What you can do is simply press on the patient's abdomen. If you just put your hand on their abdomen and press down, you'll give them a Valsalva, but they don't tend to cough and sputter and fight like they do when the anesthesiologist pushes them up to you know, 35 and 40 um, with a Valsalva. And so I don't tend to utilize it to look for leaks. I feel I can identify them uh, well enough and without any kind of fluorescein or anything, just, just looking. Um, so I don't rely on the Valsalva for that. Uh, one thing I wanna mention though, um, in regard to Valsalva or that sort of thing, is if you have a small leak, say you have a small opening in the diaphragm after you've done a standard pituitary um, tumor removal, one thing that may be helpful is put the patient in reverse Trendelenburg, put their head down. You can either give a Valsalva or do what I choose to do, just push on their, on their abdomen uh, a little bit, and you can get a lot of CSF out that way. So if you're going to need to repair the leak, take out five or 10 cc's of CSF simply by putting their head down, or like I said, pushing on the belly or, or a mild Valsalva if you choose, and you'll get some CSF out. Once you put that patient back into reverse Tendelenburg, you'll see the diaphragm will go right up. You're no longer fighting against the, against the flow of, of uh, CSF um, coming at you, and it's less of a battle. So you can actually dry things up and then get a sense of what's going on. Sometimes you can even do a direct repair of the diaphragm. I did that yesterday uh, in, in, a, in a case. Um, so you can just directly repair that even if you need. Um, so just use that maybe to your advantage, um, the, the, the Valsalva in a different way, 
or putting the head down and getting spinal fluid out. That can be very advantageous sometimes and make it simpler and clarify where the leak is coming from and that sort of thing. As far as lumbar drain, no. I don't use a lumbar drain virtually for anything except a patient that presents with a significantly elevated ICP. If we know there's an idiopathic intracranial hypertension patient, you know, pseudo tumor cerebri, pressure is super high, we're going into fixing the cephalocele or whatever it is. Um, if we tap them and their pressures, you know, uh, lumbar puncture and their pressure is 50 or, or, or 60 or 70, you know, centimeters of water, then in that case, I'll put a lumbar drain mainly to maintain the pressure while we do our repair and to temporize them until we, we need to put a uh, cerebrospinal fluid diversion like a VP shunt or whatever you choose. And that's pretty much the only circumstance. I don't use them for the, for the primary repair. And if a patient comes back with a leak, we tend to still not put a lumbar drain. I'll go figure out what the problem is. And I'll, and I'll directly repair the, uh, the, the cranial base defect rather than have them sit with a drain. And what we found over the years was we would put a uh, lumbar drain in place, <clears throat> try to divert the fluid, get them to heal. And what I found more often was it just had them stay in the hospital for three or four days, eventually clamp it, and often they would be leaking anyway. And so it just seemed like it wasted a lot of time in, in the hospital stay and immobility. We found that just going back, identifying the problem and fixing the, the, uh, the, the leak directly was more effective. Uh, thanks, Dr. James. Uh, there's a question to, uh, for Dr. Bassant. Uh, Dr. Bassant? Yeah. Yes, uh, there's a question for you. That what do you mean by two approaches in large petroclival uh, meningiomas? Do you mean combined subtemporal and retrosigmoid in the same session or a staged surgery? Uh, uh, today, I do mostly staged. I, if I have to do, there is a large middle fossa component and there is a large posterior fossa component, I usually would stage it today. But everything depends on the mostly the consistency of the tumor. The firm tumor is much more difficult than a vascular tumor. I'm not so worried about a vascular tumor. But as a firm tumor, it takes much longer and especially depends on where the vessels are, if the vessels are inside the tumor, uh, the meticulous dissection is the way to go. So I would do in two stages. Uh, as I said, if there is a middle fossa and, uh, and a big posterior fossa component, today I do a posterior fossa component uh, by retrosig. Uh, depending on which which one is big, uh, the, that the first stage is that one. A large middle fossa, then I do a middle fossa approach, either a, a, a petrous apex or a OZ. If the large uh, posterior fossa component, small middle fossa, then I do a retrosig first and then go back. Uh, 20, 25 years back, most of this I would try to do in a single stage, either a, by a petrosectomy, posterior petrosectomy, or a combined anterior and posterior. I don't do that anymore. Uh, as you know, Dr. Misra, the, your presentation is one uh, of the most changeable uh, pathologies in uh, skull-based surgery, in the neurosurgery. Uh, we, we would like to, to, to guide us and to, to guide the attendee about the golden tips and the golden tricks for those uh, most uh, challengeable pathologies ever. What do you think? Well, I think the, the, the first, I think the most important thing is uh, the, if the young neurosurgeon wants to do a petroclival meningioma, he needs to spend days, weeks, months in the lab before he should do it. Because these are not common tumors. I mean, you don't need to do a petroclival meningioma. You can get away not doing petroclival meningioma throughout your career and you're not going to lose very much. These are difficult tumors. And, and the first important thing, of course, is get your training in the lab so that you know all the, all the approaches, number one. Number two, spend time with your mentor. Spend time with people who have large experience. Go. I, I have moved when I was young. I have moved many, many places. I've gone around and seen. And then, of course, and then you choose the approach, which is the, the approach which you can uh, do justice to the patient. And just because X, Y, G saying that this is the best approach, there's no point doing it. And uh, of course, we have all uh, made mistakes, but learn from that mistake. We, we learn from that mistake and don't repeat it over a period of time. That's the only way. Uh, for the young neurosurgeons, very great question. I thank you very much for asking me. The best thing you can do to not to damage the patient is to remember all your complications. Mind you, I, I honestly, uh, I'm telling you, every single patient, not only petroclival, every single patient I have managed, 
or the patient uh, who has had complication or who has died, and they have many. Uh, I mean, if somebody comes back and tells you that there is no complication, either he's telling truth, untruth, or he is God. He's not neurosurgeon. So I have a lot of complications. I remember, I remember every single patient's face, not only their face, their family, their pain, and you feel the pain. <clears throat> that's the only way you don't repeat it. And that's why you change over a period of time. As I said, 25 years back, everybody, every single patient was mine was a dedicated skull-based approach. That was the way to go. That was the golden rule. I don't do it anymore. We have many, many sessions. We have had arguments with uh, legends, names, which are my heroes also, like Professor Almeti. He's one of one of the great, greatest skull-based surgeons whom I look up to. But I don't do everything like he does because I can't do it. So why, why do I have to follow him for a particular thing? As I said, he's one of the greatest skull-based surgeons whom I admire, whom I have learned. I have visited him. I've seen him operating. Similarly, but I, I do the way I can do the best thing. And at the end of the day, you have to have a good patient rather than a good MR. And that you learn with your mistakes, unfortunately. It's a very quite, quite uh, golden tricks and tips from one of the eminent uh, neurosurgeons and skull base in the world ever. Uh, there is a question to, to Dr. James. Dr. James, are you here? I, I'm here. Uh, yes, uh, there's a question about the use and the useful of the fat graft. Do you still use it or you depend on another types of inlay and onlay? Uh, we really don't. Um, I don't use fat for almost anything any longer. Uh, the one place it remained to some capacity years ago was, again, for the clival defect. If there's a really deep clival defect, my nasal septal flap or my covering won't quite fit all the way back and we don't want to leave a dead space then I would put a little bit of fat there, but I really just use gel foam now and I think it's fine. Uh, we've been able to tailor our flaps better. We can often get Dura to flap without any dead space in between, uh, but that's one place uh, I guess you could argue. But even with that, like I said, it's typically just some gel foam. I don't, I don't use fat for almost anything um, that I do endonasal uh, any longer. Uh, there's been problems you know, reported with it, in, intradural use and infections and packing and causing compression and I just don't, I don't believe in that. I'd rather get things back to their normal configuration and not all packed and, and having problems. So no, I, I really don't utilize fat. We use sometimes fascia lata, uh, depending on the, uh, the tissue and the repair we're doing and what's available, uh, but not fat packing. Uh, I think Omar- uh, There is a we, one, there uh, is his hand. I will, yes. Yes. One, one at the uh, end. You, you are in the panel now. Please speak. The, the, our colleague yes. who raised the, the hand, please speak directly. Uh, I'm Dr. Ali Mashini. I want to ask uh, Professor James regarding the patient with uh, increased intracranial pressure and uh, with uh, there is uh, Indonesian transphenoid and uh, <coughs> there is a synthesis and you repair it and you. So there is a leak. We did the uh, lumbar drain and we back it. And uh, after that, after five days, everything is stopped. We remove the lumbar drain. Then later on, there is a recurrent of the CSF leak. You know, before surgery, there is uh, the, the pituitary itself, it distended to the, the cavernous, uh, to the, the sphenoid sinus, and there is a mucosal also with it. So that is indicating pre op there was an increase in intracranial pressure, although this is, uh, discussed with the patient, but is after that, what the approach we can do? Shall we do a lambobritoneal shunt or we are bare again and we think that it, it will be good because there is a sign of increasing intracranial pressure? Yeah, I mean, that you're going to battle uphill all the way for that, right? The, the pressure is high. It's like you're, you're walking upstream. It's, yes. it's a hard thing to win. And I think it's important to recognize that because we've all seen that or seen it in a, in a patient referred to us or in a colleague that, that just battled against something. In the end, it was actually high pressure. And it, we've seen that with patients having pituitary surgery that get sent into us with these constant leaks and, and that sort of thing. You, you have to address the pressure. And I think it's really important to try to recognize that preoperatively, right? It's, it's a little more evident when you have a meningoencephalocele or, or some situation like that, a patient that presents with symptoms of pseudotumor cerebri. But some don't. Some patients walk and talk and function fine with pressures that are pretty elevated. And if we don't recognize that um, immediately or recognize it up front, when you get into a battle like you've been in, it becomes a little more clear. And you've got to address the pressure one way or another. 
otherwise you're going to keep fighting that battle. The other thing to recognize is there, we wrote a paper on this recently that, that there are a significant number of patients that'll have rebound, rebounded cranial hypertension yeah, where they've got a, a leak or an encephalocele and you do a, a primary repair. You might tap them at the time of surgery and their pressure is 15 or you know, whatever metrics you use would say 15 centimeters of water, something normal. You do your repair and then you'll see their pressure climb, right? And we saw that in, in over 40% of the cases that we treated um, that actually have an underlying intracranial hypertension. That's also been seen in spinal leaks. When patients present with spinal leaks and intracranial hypotension, when you repair their leak, you'll see this rebound intracranial hypertension. And so recognize that too, that even if they seem normal up front, many of them can climb afterward. You might see it with an extensive tumor removal. They start kind of normal. We've seen that, right? Take a big acoustic out, next thing you know, they have hydrocephalus. And that could be the case with an endonasal operation as well. So there's a number of, of ways you can go down that pathway of battling a high pressure. And so recognize that, but I think your, your, your answer is to fix the pressure. Um, those are kind of repairs that you can get as fancy as you want. And even if you get a really creative and robust repair, it's probably gonna leak somewhere else, right? So you just have yeah. to be ready to kind of manage that. Uh, Omar, there's uh, uh, two, uh, two and D raising hands, uh, Dr. Khalid and uh, Andolin. We'll start with Dr. Uh, Khalid. Khalid Shazli no? can speak directly. He's in the panel now. Khalid, are you yes. here? Hello. Yes, I'm here. Thank you, Doctor. Yes. Thank you, Doctor Nasser. Thank you, Doctor Omar, for this excellent uh, topics. Thank you, Doctor James Evans. I'm very happy to see you again. I'm trying to open the camera to see you to let you, to let you see me. I don't know if you want to see me now or not, Doctor Evans. <laughs> I can always but close my eyes. It's okay. <laughs> but I'm very happy to see you again. Uh, let me open the camera. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure if I, I will be able to open it. I'm trying. <laughs> but anyway, I'm happy to see you. Uh, COVID make uh, us uh, make it very difficult for all of us to, to reconnect. But thanks to Zoom meeting and thanks to all my uh, all this technology and uh, all the efforts of my professors. Uh, I, I want to, get, to make it short for you. My question, maybe I know some information about it, but uh, not all. Uh, my question is, in case we, we face uh, uh, a tumor where we are not quite sure if we are going to use the nasoceptal flap or not, um, in case of probable need, if we probably will need nasoceptal flap, but we are not quite sure, here in Egypt, we sometimes cauterize the, the flap, some people don't, but there is a technique you use to preserve the nasoceptal flap in all cases you, 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 you do endonasally. Uh, some do the rescue flap, some do other techniques. I think you have techniques for all the cases. Can you let us know rapidly how do you use it? Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Khaled. So um, yeah, so the, I think you need to plan in advance, number one. Uh, Planning ahead is the most critical thing. And, and that comes with experience and you know, recognizing whether you may need the flap or not. Uh, there are certainly circumstances when all of us get surprised and, and, and maybe you, you find you need it at the end or you harvested it and you don't need it at the end. So we have a whole algorithm for that. In fact, we have a, a, some previous publication and another one we're working on currently um, that sort of goes through these, these uh, graded approaches. Because many, you know, for, for instance, for pituitary surgery, you can do something as simple as a, uni a unilateral approach. I do it all the time. And it, it reduces the morbidity by 50% because you don't even enter the other nasal cavity. It also inherently will preserve the other flap perfectly. And then you just have to worry about preserving the ipsilateral flap. So that's one example of that. But we have a graded approach, much like we have our graded repair um, algorithm that I um, presented. Uh, a couple of things. So one is if you're not sure, raise the flap in the beginning. But the important thing is you can put it back. We didn't know that in the beginning. We, this was all things we just discovered in the early 2000s. But you can mobilize a flap if you're careful and put it right back on the septum. And I could show you videos in different presentations that we have that in many cases, and you couldn't tell which side I harvested it from. It heals beautifully and it preserves the pedicle and it doesn't shrink and scar if you're, if you're careful with the tissue. So one thing is what we call a raise and return. So if you're not sure, raise it, put it back. Or if you need to go down through the area where the pedicle is located, you could always um, 
raise the flap, do your resection because you would have disrupted the pedicle if you didn't raise it and then simply put it back on the septum. Um, we have a number of other approaches we use. You mentioned something called rescue flap. And this is a way of making a couple of back cuts, basically starting the first couple of cuts of raising a nasal septal flap uh, in order to try to uh, avoid damaging the pedicle. And that also came from a combination of our UPMC colleagues and now our other colleagues, uh, Rick Crow and, and Danny Prevedello at OSU and some other centers that really promoted that. In the beginning, there were problems <clears throat> because they'd make those cuts and they would disrupt olfaction by way of using cautery and cutting up, up superiorly. <clears throat> so they developed something called the SOS flap, um, which was septal olfactory strip sparing flap, and in order to try to prevent that, that oh anosmia. We never went that route. Uh, Mark and Rosen, and my, my close colleague I and I and the rest of our team, went a different route like by the mobilizing the mucosa without them. making all those cuts. Uh, and so you can actually start, mobilize down the pedicle and still make a large phenotomy without making cuts for, for the rescue flap and just still preserve the pedicle and put it back where it belongs. Um, but we use tailored type approaches. If I need a, a sphenotomy on one side for pituitary tumor, on the opposite side, I may just open the sphenodos a little bit, just enough to get my camera or an instrument in. You don't need a wide open with both turbinates out and huge septectomy in every case. In fact, we've also worked toward minimizing the septectomy even, where we don't do any septectomy for the majority of our cases and zero mucosal septectomy. We just mobilize the tissue and put it back. And by virtue of doing these things, being facile working in a smaller place, tailoring these approaches to what you need for the pathology, you can typically preserve the pedicles. I would tell you 100% on one side and in the vast majority, you can preserve the pedicles on both sides and they'll still be ready to use in the future. And we have a paper on that as well of the cases that we had to then salvage when we use these maneuvers and then needed to go back and harvest the flap because of a recurrence or something, say a cordoma or whatever the case was. And we were able to preserve and utilize the flap in all those cases. And so if you follow these kind of tailored approaches, you'll by nature protect the pedicle from the beginning. You don't need to just go in and cauterize the pedicle on both sides. Um, there's ways you can, you can do this in a, in a gentle way, but you need to be comfortable working in a smaller place and working beyond some anatomy where you don't open everything so widely um, on, on each side. Um, so, and I could just refer you, so I don't take too long to a couple of the papers we wrote, or I'll be happy to speak about it another time if that's helpful. Thank you very much. I think, I think we have uh, somebody raising hand. Yes, uh, Dorian, Dorian. Can you speak directly or now in the panel? Unmute him, uh, unmute uh, Ahmed Magdi, unmute him, Ahmed Magdi. He's already unmuted. Okay. Okay, until Rolian, he join, please. until he join, uh, I'd like to introduce Muhammad and No Ali. Muhammad, are you here? Muhammad and No Ali. Yes. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning, Dr. James. Uh, it's really nice to see you again. It's been a while. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nasser, Dr. Omar. Uh, Dr. James is a is an eminent. Uh, Pennsylvanian neurosurgeon, and I've been introduced to him by a very um, eminent uh, other neurosurgeon, Dr. Khaled Aziz, uh, and I'm sure that Dr. Evans had a very good memories with him. Uh, Dr. Aziz is one of the best uh, neurosurgeons uh, around the world, and uh, thank God he's doing much better right now, and I guess Dr. James and Dr. Walter Jean has a lot to, to say about him, about me, but I know we're running short out of time and both of them are uh, very busy, have a very busy schedule today. So uh, thank you so much for having having uh, you here and we hope that you are um, become a frequent uh, a, a member of our panelists. Yeah, it would be my pleasure, honestly, my pleasure. I enjoy all of you and, and all the work you do. And if I could just make a kind word about our good friend Khaled Aziz, I've known him for many, many years. He's been like a brother to me. And I will tell you that he is not only a spectacular, smart and skilled surgeon, but he's got a heart that's even bigger than that. Uh, this is the kind of person that will give you the shirt from his back and, uh, and more. And I really Absolutely. think the world to him and when, you, when and if you see him, give him my regards and... Uh, He's a good, good, close colleague. We have many, many long uh, years of fond memories. So thank you for mentioning Colin. 
I will call him on the weekend and I will make sure that I'll tell him that. Thank you, sir. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Thanks, Muhammad. Uh, Muhammad helped me uh, in organizing this webinar. I would like to thank him, actually. And uh, I, I, I'm going to introduce Professor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Professor Hisham Basuni from Germany. Hisham, are you here? Hisham? Okay. Maybe he joined. I'm, later. I'm, I'm, oh, I'm here. I'm sorry. I, I was just I was just <laughs> unmuted. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you very, thank you very much. much. I said good morning, good evening, wherever you are. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Shem. Do you do you like to make any comments about about uh, the talks, uh, or we uh, move to the next uh, speaker? Uh, just just one comment, and uh, Professor Ali uh, uh, asked the question if there's a high pressure. Um, um, situation after removing a tumor. Um, in very few cases, I think you will end up with a shunt. There's no so other solution than a final shunt. I personally, um, I'm preferring the um, uh, the ventricular peritoneal shunt. I'm not using the lumbar, lumbar peritoneal shunt. Um, but I, even if the, uh, the neuroimaging is uh, is uh, looks good and shows no hydrocephalus, but you have got um, um, well ma maybe a malresorption situation after removal of the tumor, and you are you are making revisions and revisions and trying to do your best to to solve the CSF leak, but um, finally the the shunt may be a solution. So this I just want to to add uh, to to a very. Beautiful presentation, Professor James. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Hisham. Uh, Omar, do you have other questions? Yes, there's a, a one question to Dr. Mishra. Uh, he's here or he left? Professor Mishra, he sent me a message uh, and he will be back in... Uh, he, has, he has another webinar just starting now mm -hmm. and he's moderator. He will come back after 10 minutes. And so maybe okay, we make okay. uh, this question at the end of the yeah, session. After he we come have, back. After we have back. another yes. panel discussion at the end of this session. I think okay. now, uh, Omar, we uh, move to the to our third speaker. Would you introduce him, please? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. James. Thank you, Dr. Mesra. Now to the second session. Uh, Dr. Ali El Mashar from Oman. Uh, welcome, Dr. Ali. He will speak on the sobraorbital keyhole surgery for brain tumors and annuals. Please welcome. Thank you, Prof. Can can share the... Yes, please. The power? Yes. You are seeing my... Uh... Not yet, not yet. Okay, I'm sharing, so... Yes, now, okay. See? Yes, yes, perfect, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. I would like to thank Dr. Nasser and his colleagues, and also a um, pleasure uh, to, to, to be with the, the Beno, uh, and uh, Dr. Mishra, as well, Dr. James, all the, our colleagues. It's my pleasure to present today the supraorbital keyhole craniotomy for excision of tumors and clipping of aneurysms. Um, uh, uh, in the National Neurosurgery Center in Oman, and all the cases will be referred to us. There is nothing to be disclosed. Actually, uh, I was one of the people who's resisting uh, the keyhole surgery earlier because we uh, learned from our uh, teachers that is, you know, you have to have excess place to not to retract the brain and. Uh, although and to be a safe. So, but is uh, in, in initially, I was one of the people who's resisting the supra uh, orbital keyhole surgery because we thought it's a small and it will not be a corridor enough to remove either tumors or cleaving aneurysm. Uh, when I'm traveling, so one day I was, uh, you know, you can see this bar in the airport where it's not allowed to, to pass your, uh, you know, just uh, uh, big uh, bags and so on. So I was uh, always putting my 
back in this position. So that means I have a perception in my mind. I have to turn my bag in other, not in a normal way when I am pulling it, but is I have to turn it in a way that it can pass. So this meaning I have in my perception, it will not pass through. One day I bought it in the normal way. So I found it is passing. So that is, so always we have something in our mind, either a negative or positive perception for something. So always we are resisting change because we, our mind already put in, in, a, you know, in a moment or in a way that it, this is the right way. Also, if we are looking to this picture, so we see a rock here, we see a tree is here, we see the mountain here. So if we are thinking in the other way, so this is only a shadow. So it, this is a rock is only it's in the lake and this is a tree is, is the shadows. So, so we have to think out of the box. We should not resist, you know, something in or innovation in a way that is because we have a false perception. So supraorbital keyhole surgery, we started more than 15 years ago. There is, you know, a point which we have to raise out to have during this procedure, which the surgeon has to be aware of. First, the incision, which is at the supraorbital keyhole, I was learning it is through the hair, but it's later on I change it because it, there is during the scar, there will be no growth of the hair. So you have to put in a way that is for cosmetic. Second thing, the supraorbital, the, uh, the nerve, which supraorbital nerve here, which we have to be aware of. The second thing, the front uh, branch of the the seventh nerve, you have to be aware of it. In the same time, you are close to the eye. Close to the eye, you have to avoid pressure on the eye globe. This is the points which every surgeon who do this approach has to put in his mind. There is a structure in that, in, in this area, which you have also to take care of. If you, this is your craniotomy, you have to be also aware of the frontal sinus. Also about the temporal uh, muscle, which the frontal uh, branch of the seventh nerve is there. So if sometimes you may have to extend to approach a tumor, which is beyond to your view, you have to dissect the muscle with all uh, neural and vascular branch slightly lateral, so you can reach the area properly. Here, when you do craniotomy, that is the, the rim here, the interior, the inner blade, the inner part of the bone, you have to dr drill it, and this drilling will give you an excess of one or two millimeters, which give you a big corridor when you drill that, the inner blade, of the, the, the bow. So we have a points, frontal sinus, supraorbital nerve, frontal branch of the seventh nerve, and also the inner drilling of the inner part of the bow. This is very important points to keep in mind. The patient will be in this position. We are looking to him in this way, but in, during the surgery, he will be in this position. One of the important points also, you, the, the, the gravity will pull back down the frontal loop. And this one, just don't retract. Just take your section, you know, aspirate CSF gently. It will take five to 10 minutes from you. Then after that, you will find a very big corridor and there is no retraction on your, on the, 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 the brain. So in this, after that, you will find yourself in front when you retract, just the, there is no retraction, just supporting the frontal lobe 
you know, all this vascular structure is there. If there is a tumor is there, you may also go medial or lateral according to your uh, uh, approach and the tumor or the clipping of aneurysm. So in this point, we have the craniotomy part, we have the inner drilling the inner blade, we have the supraorbital part, we uh, nerve, we have the frontal sinus, and we have the branch of the frontal uh, part, branch of the uh, seventh nerve. So this is, when you open that, this structure will be under you. You can see the chiasma, optic nerve, the internal carotid artery, M1, and you can even reach M2. Also with that, you can see anterior cerebral artery. So if you are, want to remove the tumor, you can remove the tumor, either medial to your chiasma, also clipping of aneurysm in one of the structures of the vessels around you, and you have enough uh, corridor. So on that, in this position, you can take almost the way of the terrional approach. So this is the incision. You will have the craniotomy here, there, and you will have a very large corridor. You can remove the tumor or clipping aneurysms. There is some, in some uh, articles in the uh, journals and in the journals of uh, craniofacial surgery, they say that it's about the supraorbital keyhole approach. They conclude that the structure can be visualized in the anterior and middle fossa and branch of the supraorbital uh, approach, keyhole craniotomy, minimize the brain retraction and adequate expose of the, of the lesion with minimal craniotomy sites. Also in the world uh, neurosurgery review regarding the literature of transciliary supraorbital approach, there is, they conclude that this is a safe and effective invasive uh, alternative to a conventional craniotomy in an experienced hand. In the trial clinical of neurosurgery journal, about 10 years experience with the supraorbital subfrontal ab uh, approach through eyebrow skin incision, they conclude that this is a low, a wide exposure of extending bilateral and deep seated intracranial areas and a very good uh, approach uh, comparing to conventional and with a very, in a very good experienced surgeon. Although this, uh, you know, any a neurosurgeon, which uh, a consultant surgeon, he exposed the conventional craniotomy, he has to do one or two, then it will be an easy way rather than the, you know, it's not need a much uh, time to, for experience rather than to see one or two uh, approach and then you will proceed. Uh, in the comprehensive study, there is comparing the Indonesian versus supraorbital keyhole removal of craniofrangioma and tuberculum silly meningioma, they see that is, they conclude that meningioma supraorbital route is recommended for meningioma right larger than 35 millimeter of, and also if there is a growth beyond the clinoid, uh, uh, clinoid uh, artery. So the supraorbital approach also for a recurrent residual supracellular tumors, they conclude that supraorbital uh, approach is a safe and effective and alternative route for recurrent residual supracellular tumors previously treated by conventional craniotomy. In Journal of Neuro Neurology and Neurosurgery, uh, supraorbital keyhole approach to the skull base evaluation, the complication of CSF leak, they found that you know, usually in a conventional, it's coming from zero to 9.1. And in, in 88 per, uh, cases of supraorbital approach, only 2.5. Uh, 
and there is no dangerous meningi meningitis after supraorbital keyhole approach. So we, uh, uh, our article in American Journal uh, of case reported, we uh, submit this case article and of uh, and eight cases, six cases, which is uh, we found that is is uh, for pediatric A group, and we found uh, an effective, uh, less uh, time consuming, less blood loss, fast recovery, and there is no issue regard, regard regarding cosmetic effect. I have some cases I will presenting to you. And this is a lady of 48. You can see the incision here. And you can see here the craniotomy part. And after you expose the area, you will see the lesion, which is also here, the CTA, and here cerebral artery here, which is most of the time we are depending on the CTA or MRI for aneurysms. So this is a clip of the aneurysm in the same approach. And you can see we have enough visualization of the lesion and you can clip it you know, directly without problem. Here a child of four months old, you can see the incision here. He has, you know, a congenital arachnoid cyst, which is affecting actually posterior fossa and also infra and supra tentorium to the third ventricle. And that is the one, you know, some of my colleagues, they ask to do it retromastoid, but it's our plan, you know, to do it in the same way. And if you see here, You can see the approach here can reach from the same, I can reach the arachnoid here, go to lamina terminalis, go to the posterior fossa, communicate the uh, CSF all compartment to each other with, in the same approach without much cosmetic effect and fast recovery, less blood loss, as well as very, uh, you know, short procedure. There is a case which is eight years old with optic chasmatic glioma. I operated on him on 2012. It's six o'clock. And there is no recurrence on 16. I'm still covering, uh, following him uh, until now. And there is no recurrence from in the same approach. You can see the tumor here the tumor there, and this is post-op. This another case. You, we have an intra-tumor hemorrhage, which is hypothalamic tumor bleed. And this is the same approach which we did. This is after four years with her, with her uh, father. You can see the craniotum part here. And you can see she's a little bit fatty because of the steroid. She is, uh, follow up with the endocrinologist. This is a two years old girl with loss of vision, right eye, left uh, eye only light perception. You can see the tumor here. There we thought it's craniopharyngioma before surgery, but it's intraoperative. We found it is a thalamic, it's a hypo chasmatic hypothalamic tumor. And you can see the incision, which is here. And this is both of, you can see a leak of some blood is there. Another case, which is 12 years old girl, you can see huge tumor, which is chasmatic hypothalamic tumor here. And you can see both of the coronal, sagittal and axial cut. So this approach, you can remove even huge tumor with the same approach. You know, it's not, it can take almost, almost, you know, the, like the conventional tinto, uh, 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 the 
uh, terminal approach, almost you can do it with the same approach, supraorbital. This is, you can see the incision here. Now already I changed the incision up at the end of the hair, rather than, because here the scar, you can prevent uh, growth of the hair. So I'm now changing here, there, and you can see one of my patients, which is here. She is a doctor. This is, she is a doctor. So I have this, uh, a balocytic astrocytoma. I thought it was before it was uh, craniofrangium, but it came to be uh, balocytic astrocytoma. And you can see here the incision at the end, almost hairline. So you can with, uh, you know, uh, make up almost, you cannot, you cannot see the incision. It's a good for young A group children, six months old with fail to thrift, cachexia, decreased vision, unable to sit, and here only weight is three kilos, almost 240 mil of blood. If we do it, this one with, this is here MRI, we do it with a conventional terrional whatever approach before we reach, she will lose her blood. But this one, there is no transfusion because there is no drop of blood almost from the same incision. And you can remove totally the tumor with the same approach. You can see small part of the tumor is here. This is another case which is 13 years old. You can see the incision here where it's stopped. There is no growth of hair, but is, this is anterior cerebral artery, a CTA and you can see the clip here. So with this, I conclude that supraorbital keyhole approach is a useful and eyebrow brought to a safe, effective, suitable, convenient for the treating of tumor of anterior fossa and middle fossa. And it's an excellent approach for pediatric age group because less time consuming minimal blood loss, fast recovery, and there is no almost uh, cosmetic effect. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ali, for this uh, very nice presentation. We, we shift to the next uh, speaker, and the discussion will be after the second talk. Uh, Dr. Walter. Omar, uh, uh, Omar uh, now uh, our last speaker, Professor Basant Misra, came back again. We have some questions for you, Basant, but uh, would you excuse <laughs> us after Walter Jean? Uh, we are going to, uh, to have some discussion, okay? Basant, can you hear me? Yeah, 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 I can hear you. Okay, thank yeah, you very ahead. much. Now we are honored to introduce Professor Walter Jim from the United States of America. Uh, Omar, can you introduce our guest, please? Uh, okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Walter Jim, uh, joining us for this uh, very nice uh, session. Uh, Dr. Walter Jim, he will speak on the mixed reality in skull uh, based uh, neurosurgery. Yes, welcome. Thank you. All right, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Uh, Okay, here we go. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great honor for me to be here with you for the session on modern skull based surgery, webinar number 36 uh, with the Egyptian Society, uh, to be on a panel with, uh, with Jim Evans and, and uh, uh, Dr. Misra and, uh, and Dr. Uh, I'm going to pronounce your name, Al Mashani. Uh, it's a great honor for me. Thank you very, very much. Um, Let's see, I am going to continue. Uh, th this is the only Egyptian neurosurgeon I know, and it's the aforementioned Dr. Khalid Aziz. He and I were fellows together in Cincinnati, uh, and this was a picture a long time ago, and of course, uh, here we go again with, with the mention of Khalid. Um, you can also see in that picture, an almost pediatric Dr. Froelich uh, in the back there. Those are the uh, times together a uh, long time ago now. Um, Today, uh, I am going to talk about mixed reality and neurological surgery. We are a long way from that picture. Uh, technology has advanced a long way, and I am speaking to you uh, from Pennsylvania at the Lehigh Valley Hospital as Chief of Neurological Surgery here. All right, so what is mixed reality and, and all this uh, new technology about? 
uh, mixed reality is a combination of virtual reality, uh, augmented reality, and augmented uh, and, and uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, virtual reality simply is a technology that we can use to transform uh, two-dimensional uh, MRIs and CT scans into three-dimensional objects. Uh, into three-dimensional objects that are maneuverable, resettable, drillable, erasable, uh, rotatable, and so on. And so you can see that uh, this transformed into this. And then from that, we actually transform into something like this. This is the exact same patients. So you can see that for uh, our purposes as well for the patient, this can be a very useful technology. And I'll show you uh, how that is. Uh, from virtual reality, we then go to augmented reality, which is uh, putting the seg segmented anatomy in virtual reality into uh, a trackable microscope uh, and projected as augmented reality objects. So this is the patient asleep in the op operating room, and I'm projecting uh, virtual reality objects as augmented reality uh, projections uh, through a track microscope in the anatomical correct position. And that really helps surgery in ways that I can also show you that. So that's what mixed reality is about. Mixed reality has been used in the last decade or so for surgical rehearsal, patient engagement, anatomical teaching, anatomical investigations, as well as finally with navigation. And I'll show you how uh, that really leads to a better outcome. It was initially produced uh, and uh, manufactured for uh, patient engagement. You can imagine how a patient can benefit from this. Uh, patients do not uh, learn how to read two-dimensional CT and MRI scans, but they can appreciate as they fly into their own skull that, oh, there's an AVM. That's what an AVM looks like. That's what an in, uh, inflow looks like. And that's what the outflow looks like. And, oh, this is how you're going to operate on me. This all makes sense. So it uh, gives the patient a new perspective on uh, what their pathology is and why they might need surgery. Uh, from a surgical planning point of view, it is also very important. Uh, the initial uh, renderings of, of this technology we used only for uh, examining the anatomy, but now we can really interact with the anatomy for surgical planning. Here's an example. Here's a uh, somewhat complex tumor in the pineal region uh, that has many approaches. We don't have to do any guessing with uh, experience anymore. We can simply practice the approaches like the interhemispheric approach uh, in virtual reality and discover that, aha, it may not be the best approach. Let's try another approach to see whether it is a better approach. So the supracerebellar infratentorial approach, is this any better? Uh, it may be better because I'm not getting covered by the corpus callosum in this particular patient. Uh, but the angle of the tentorium in this particular patient is actually a little bit challenging. So again, I don't need to be guessing about uh, how much I might struggle in the OR. I can see that in my practice, how I might struggle with the tentorial angle. So I can try another approach, the paramedian approach, and discover that this, in fact, is the optimum approach and this one is gonna make life a lot easier for me and for the patient. What it's really good for is, uh, and I'm glad that I had a keyhole talk in front of mine because we're gonna talk a little bit more about the keyhole and, and uh, nuances. What virtual reality and augmented reality really is great for is the keyhole uh, concept of minimally invasive neurosurgery. Uh, whenever we look through a keyhole, like the superorbital keyhole just uh, mentioned, we really want to see this. We want to see beautiful sky, a beautiful view, uh, plenty of room to work. Uh, but if the keyhole is not placed right and in, the, in a too small size or too uh, bad a location, it can actually generate a nightmare for us. So how do we optimize the keyhole position? I call this the Goldilocks principle. You uh, all remember the story of Goldilocks and the three bears. Uh, she went into the house of the three bears and discovered that some things are too hot, some things are too cold, and some things are just right. So uh, the Goldilocks principle of skull-based surgery or keyhole surgery simply means that, for example, the hole is not too small, not too big, just right. It's not too anterior, not too posterior, just right. So that's the Goldilocks principle of where to put a keyhole. It involves the three S's size, specificity, and safety. So it has to be the right size, so it's not too small, not too big. It has to be the right location anatomically, not too far forward, not too high, not too low, just right, and thereby generate safety for a small opening to do the operation. 
So how does augmented reality, virtual reality help us do that? Here's an example. We can do a burr hole uh, for microvascular decompression uh, with augmented reality and, and virtual reality help. Now, this operation for, uh, for an MVD can be done through a very, very small hole where the hole can be placed precisely at the transverse sigmoid junction. It is only, we do bigger holes because we're not so sure where that transverse sigmoid junction is. And uh, you know, even with navigation help, that junction is not very easy to find. What in virtual reality you can do is that you can actually look at the skull, look at the fifth nerve, uh, as you see here, and the offending artery here, and you can drill that hole from inside of the skull out. So you know precisely where that hole is going to be. So I can then do this in the office, put the hole in the exact location where I need to be, and then now save that as a template. Now, what, what does that mean? That means that the hole that I drilled in is saved as a computer file that I import into the operating room as an augmented reality template. I'm gonna, pro I'm gonna project that template onto a anesthetized patient now in a navigation track microscope. So that hole is projected in the exact same location as I did practice in the office. So you can see that there's the marker for the burr hole. That burr hole is projected onto a, a fixed patient, fixed in the OR. I am marking that burr hole uh, as I practiced uh, in the office in an anatomically correct location. You can see the mastoid here, the ear, the patient is here. And this is all projected in augmented reality. Once the bone is exposed, I'm going to reproject that hole, reproject that marker. And again, the hole is made in the exact same location as I practice it with my inside out drilling. Now I simply duplicate that hole. Again, only 13 millimeters. Uh, put the sponge in to decompress the fifth nerve, and uh, I'm simply duplicating a plan that I've already made in the office, and I back out, and there you have it, 13 millimeter hole craniotomy done, uh, successfully decompressed the trigeminal nerve. So navigation is now used not to find your way in the operating room, but navigation is now used to uh, uh, duplicate a plan. These virtual reality created templates projected as augmented reality objects are now simply the plan that you're going to duplicate in the OR. You're not using navigation to find your way anymore. Here's an example of a keyhole opening. Um, here's an op here, clinoid meningioma that we're going to do through a very small opening. In virtual reality, you examine the, uh, the anatomy and you can try out various approaches. The first one we're going to try out is the superorbital keyhole. Uh, I'm not going to belabor the point, but we can do the superorbital keyhole in virtual reality. We're going to take the orbital bar with it. Boom, the foam flap is gone. And then we're going to try to practice that an, uh, clinoidectomy. We're going to do another approach, the mini terional approach. We're going to drill inside out again. We're going to put that hole right at the tip of the sphenoid wing. We're going to drill a three centimeter only diameter uh, keyhole, mini terional keyhole for this. And you can practice both operations. And in this particular case, I decided that the mini terional approach was a little bit better. So on we go. We take that as a now a navigable template, and we're going to project it onto an anesthetized patient in the OR. There's the anesthetized patient's eyebrow. There are the objects, and here's my template. There's my template in the tracked microscope, tracked with navigation. I'm going to mark that templated opening onto the patient's scalp. scalp and then from there and plan the incision and plan the hair shave. There it is. And I'm again, just simply duplicating the plan that I had already practiced in the clinic, in the office and so on and so forth. I'm not gonna belabor the point. I'm gonna fast forward here. We're gonna do the anterior clinoidectomy. That's the anterior clinoid loose, clinoid comes out. And then again, continue the operation, tumor comes out, optic nerve is decompressed, there you have the end of the field. And we take out the final piece of the dura that was on the anterior clinoid process to create a Simpson grade number one uh, resection. And in this particular case, the augmented reality significantly helped me uh, in uh, increasing my confidence and also minimize 
optimizing the opening for this patient. Uh, because the superorbital keyhole was the subject of the last talk, I'm going to show you the augmented reality for this one. This is a very similar uh, a similar clinoid meningioma that we actually did through a modified uh, clinoidectomy with a, with a superorbital keyhole. Again, there's no doubt about anything because we practiced this in the operating room, uh, in the clinic first, in the office first. We uh, practiced the craniotomy. Again, we're not going to belabor the point put a marker that we're going to use for the operation itself, where we track it. We do the superorbital keyhole, make it go away. We, this one, we're also going to take the superorbital ridge to make some room for ourselves. And now we switch to the intracranial view for do the clinoidectomy. Again, I'm not going to belabor the point. We do the clinoidectomy in VR, and then we're going to take it into the OR. Now, in the OR, I'm remarking where my burr hole was. There's my uh, subfrontal view, uh, and then we're going to do the clinoidectomy. Those objects that you saw in VR are now projected as AR objects that guides me to drill the clinoid. I'm opening the optic foramen right now. That marker was for the yellow marker was for the optic foramen. There you go. It's open already. Now my clinoid is just, just lateral to it. If I drill next to that blue dot, I know my clinoid is going to be gone. And in fact, we use that blue dot to drill off the clinoid and then the tumor comes out nicely. There's the clinoid completely gone and then the rest of the operation went, went fine, tumor is gone, uh, no more tumor. So uh, that's a superorbital keel. Now, uh, how about some uh, uh, very unusual approaches that we don't do every day? This increases our confidence and minimizes the cosmetic uh, damage to the patient. Here's an a intraaxial tumor. Uh, we rehearsed the lateral transorbital approach. Uh, there'll be no guessing as to whether this will be enough. This will be plenty because we practice it in the uh, office. There's your lateral orbital rim gone. We're going to drill out the orbit the greater wing of the sphenoid, that uh, tumor should be right there underneath that opening uh, that should have no trouble with exposure whatsoever. I've already done this in the office and I'm now going to do it in real life. Talking about Khalid Aziz, he, he loves this approach, the transpalpebral approach. We almost call it the Khalid approach now. Uh, here it is. We expose the superorbital rim and the lateral orbital rim as well. We're going to take off the lateral orbital rim to replace. Fast forward it. The rim is exposed. Here's the rim gone. And then we're projecting the augmented reality template onto the operation. And then we're going to guide the drilling of the sphenoid wing by how much we removed in the office, simply duplicating the plan. The dura is right there, last piece of bone comes off, open the dura and the tumor is right there, the temporal tip. No guessing whatsoever. Tumor resection is not very exciting. We can move on. And the tumor is gone at the end of the day. And, the, and here's the examination of the post-op CT versus the pre-op CT. And the patient's cosmetic result is uh, very pleasing to her. Uh, because uh, we can do this through a transpalpebral approach, again, with all the confidence in the world it will work because we practice it in VR first. Uh, final thing to say is about the middle fossa. This is really great for the middle fossa because the middle fossa has a lot of hidden things that we don't want to hurt. Uh, namely, when we drill coases, we don't want to hurt the cochlea, the labyrinth, the seventh, eight nerve complex, and the carotid artery. Uh, with virtual reality, I don't have to uh, guess where they are, and I'm not relying on uh, uh, monitor-based navigation. Monitor-based navigation has a problem that you always have to look away from the field and look away from your microscope. Uh, you're trying to find a three-dimensional object in two dimensions. Superman doesn't need a monitor. Superman sees right through it, and so augmented reality gives us that Superman x-ray vision. Uh, here's an example. So I have to drill coases here. I don't have to guess where I have to drill and where I don't know how to drill because I'm going to first practicing in, in the office, drilling this kawasi, and I can fade the bone opacity in and out so that I can see all those hidden objects. That is for an valley marker. I'm going to put a marker right at Meckel's cave and the lateral aspects to know where to stop drilling anteriorly. That yellow 
uh, wall that you see back there is a seventh eighth nerve canal uh, projected upwards. And you can see that I've segmented the cochlear and the labyrinth uh, through the bone uh, so that I don't drill into it. I'm going to practice the drilling in the office and make sure that that has an, gives me enough room. And then again, not to belabor the point, we're going to take that as navigable template into the operating room. And here it is. So all those objects that you see that we practice with are now projected into my microscope. There is no way uh, I can drill into the cochlea this way. There's no way I can drill into the uh, labyrinth this way. And I know that I'm going to have enough room uh, as well as enough safety to take out that tumor without any issues. Um, my final example is a laboratory example. This is a, a middle fossa approach for an acoustic schwannoma. Uh, I, uh, this, this eliminates all the guessing about bisecting angles, finding the arcuate eminence, because with the uh, navigation tract microscope and augmented reality, I simply drill right to the tumor uh, and I don't need to be guessing where to drill and how to bisect angles and whatnot. Uh, again, not to belabor the point, this gets me to the tumor without any issues. There it is. There's your IAC, um, and uh, the rest of the experiment goes well. So I am going to conclude now so that we can move on to discussions. Um, so virtual reality, it's great for rehearsal. It's great for creating templates that you can use to duplicate your plan in the operating room. And it really goes towards the Goldilocks principle of having openings that are small, not too small, uh, not too uh, superior, inferior, placed in a specific <laughs> environment that you need it to be, and you can minimize your opening in that way. Uh, again, the three S's are size, specificity, and that increases your safety for these keyhole approaches. And we can finally operate with x-ray vision like Superman with no head turn, no monitor-based uh, navigation. <laughs> And that's, this has revolutionized my practice. Now, a lot of people say, uh, why do you need that as an experienced skull-based surgeon? You don't need it as an experienced skull-based surgeon, but for experienced surgeon, it certainly makes you more efficient. It makes you open smaller. It makes you a better surgeon despite your experience. It can actually make you learn new things. For young surgeons, you can see that this absolutely can be helpful uh, to minimize safety, uh, to, to maximize safety, sorry, and to uh, maximize their confidence as well. So uh, I hope I didn't go too fast. Um, and don't forget this operating inside out, the virtual reality uh, capability of letting you operate from inside the skull outwards is a tremendous advantage that uh, I, yeah, you can take hold of with this. So I'm going to stop the screen share so that uh, there can be questions because I'm sure the discussion will be much more exciting than my talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Walter, for this great talk. Uh, Omar, I think we have a lot of questions. Uh, and we already have uh, Mariam Ghanem from Egypt. She would like to speak directly. Mariam, are you here? Uh, yes, Dr. Nasser, I'm here. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nasser. Thank you, Dr. Omar. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ali Mashani, for this great presentation. Uh, in your presentation, you present a lot of cases, uh, large, large, tumors, uh, large tumors or to large uh, uh, and rhythm, middle cranial and anterior cranial fossa, and you approach them from this small corridor. I will ask about the uh, usual the, uh, endoscopy uh, assisted with microscopic surgery or microscopic surgery only can do this. Uh, it's uh, microscopic, it's microscopic. Very rare we use uh, assistant endoscope, but it's most, you know, okay. if you conventional uh, terrenal approach actually. When you take the bone, you know, we uh, exposed a lot of the middle and front of uh, loop, which will not need it. Only we expose it to the air and which more traumatic to, to, to uh, the, the brain itself. Actually, this is the corridor, which is usually we use almost during terrenal approach. So if we later on, you will see yourself, you will find only just this small, uh, corridor, which is you'll use it during the terminal even. Yes. Yes, yeah. we can do this microscopic only. Yes. Yes. No endoscope, uh, microscopic, uh, you can do it microscopic. No need for endoscope, unless, unless it's, you want to see sometimes behind 
the arteries which you cannot visualize, which is far away, you may assist in the school. Thank you, Dr. Ali. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Nasser, I have another question. Yes, uh, please go ahead, uh, Mariam. Virtual, uh, like, uh, I would ask about uh, the incidence of complication if we, uh, if we can use the virtual reality in comparison to uh, traditional neuro navigation or also for traditional surgery, microscopic surgery. Uh, so, so the question is about complications of using VR? The, com the uh, comparison. Um, the comparison between the complication of the virtual reality and the other conventional approaches. Well, that's a very difficult question to answer because, well, first of all, I, I haven't had any complications using with the VR itself. Uh, if the question's about accuracy and how, how, how accurate the VR navigation is versus conventional, uh, the, the VR navigation is based on your traditional navigation system. So it, the accuracy is, uh, so in other words, the virtual reality machine is talking to your navigation machine to mm. get that data, okay? So the my navigation with VR AR is as accurate as your uh, conventional navigation is uh, because it's based on, based on that. Um, I hope that I hope that answers your question. Uh, yes, uh, also I was about uh, the complication rate when we uh, when we use a traditional microscopic surgery uh, in comparison to uh, when we use uh, a virtual reality. It can save structures more than we use the traditional surgery. Uh, help us for planning more than traditional <laughs> surgery uh, about the rate or uh, the same results. <laughs> so is, is the question about can, can using the technology avoid complication? Is that the question? No, she, she yes. means, uh, she yes. means yes. is uh, the impact of the VR uh, on your patients. Uh, the, do you feel there is a, a good uh, impact there uh, in comparison to the conventional techniques and how, how much the percentage do you Thank suggest? Thank you. Yeah. It, that 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 the technology has revolutionized uh, the practice in that it it it, tr it boosts our confidence tremendously, and uh, mm -hmm. it, it, that's what I mean by it makes you a more efficient surgeon, uh, a surgeon with smaller openings, and uh, I think you you avoid complications a lot better. Now the problem is that the data collection. Now that you have this technology, you're not going to on purpose not use it to compare your results. So it's very hard to compare apples and apples now because now that we have the technology, we're using it, um, we, we, we don't have a con case control uh, uh, trial here uh, to compare. Uh, you know, you, you can use historical controls which are always problematic. But uh, I can tell you that um, on the occasion where the machine is not working or the machine is not available to me, uh, I feel like I'm, operating with one hand tied behind my back now because I've gotten used to the technology so much. I hope that's the best way of answering that. Yes, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nasser. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jeans. It, uh, I think it looks like a sort of uh, science fiction movie, uh, Dr. Jeans. Uh, do you think of that or not? Uh, no, it's it's very science reality. <laughs> it's not just virtual reality; it's actually science reality. And I think that at, as the technology uh, becomes cheaper, uh, it will become more prevalent and hopefully much more widespread. Because I seriously see that this is a revolutionary piece of uh, uh, technology that, just as navigation was when it first appeared uh, uh, for us. And and and, and uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Misra is back on. Uh, I, I want to make a comment that that we actually did a study. For petroclivals, you you can you can turn these you can turn patient anatomy into these virtual reality models, and now use those models as laboratory specimen now to study. So you can open a retrosig and you open a uh, presig. You can open an anterior petrosectomy and compare your exposures to the same tumor in that model. Now, so you 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 seg you're separating the patient from the model that he or she is giving you. And you can play with that model in a hundred different ways to figure out 
uh, the exposure, the angles attack, uh, the blind spots and whatnot. And uh, hopefully that, that paper is gonna come out very soon to, 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 to demonstrate that power of, of, of that experiment. Nasser, Nasser, my friend, can I come in for a minute? Yes, yes please, 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 please. Yeah, that, that was a fantastic <laughs> talk. Like, you know, the problem, um, the, you know, when the MRI came, you know, many, many years back, when the MRI started coming and everybody in, in countries like mine, people said, no, no, it's too expensive. Now, every, you know, street has MRI you know, in India. I mean, <laughs> uh, same, same everywhere, maybe. Right, right. But having said that, like you said, I liked your comment. You said that when the, the technology is not working, you or you feel like you are working with one hand tied, and so that's the, you have to be very cautious about it. You know, you don't. <laughs> technology is good, but don't be too dependent on technology. I mean, you should be able to do it. Now, you can't come out and say, "Okay, my God, I mean, it's not working. I can't operate today." So that's not possible. That's number one. Number two, <laughs> you know, you are in, we are in a forum. You know, we are talking in a forum, which this is like one of our friends said, science fiction. It is because uh, there is still a long way to go to get that. You know, of course, there are centers in our region also, uh, which, you know, the best of the facilities, even in India. I mean, I'm sure Egypt, some centers may be having top of the world facilities, but there are centers where they, they don't. I mean, you said when neuro navigation came, but neuro navigation still has not come to majority of centers in this region. So one has to you know balance the thing it's a beautiful thing uh, i mean fortunately i have been fortunate to work in places you know where everything is available i'm still uh, working in a place where everything is available but um, we have to be, we need to learn the anatomy in the lab and that's very important and then you put on add on this thing I think that's very, very important. So you, you you use this facility, but don't be too dependent on this. This is for the young neurosurgeon, not uh, Dr. James. I mean, it was a fantastic talk. I really enjoyed it. And this is for my young neurosurgeons from my region. I'm talking to them. They soon go away with an idea. Okay, I don't have this, so I can't do it. No, I'm sorry. You can do everything, but you will get better when you have this. I think that is the way I would put it. I appreciate those comments, uh, Dr. Minister, very, very much. And I'm completely aligned with those comments. Completely. Uh, thank you, Dr. Minister, for this, for this crucial comment. There is another question uh, for you, Dr. Minister, uh, from your last presentation. Uh, there's a question about uh, which is more difficult to remove. Is it 4.5 uh, centimeter vestibular schwannoma? or similar size with uh, non-fibrous petroclival meningioma? No, I can't see who is talking, because, but I, 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 because there's only the, the, I'm on my mobile just now because I was on between two webinars. But thank you, my friend, for the question. But I think it's, you cannot be, I cannot just point out which one is easier because it all depends on where is that meningioma. Now, a same size meningioma in a central clivus, in the middle fossa, in the cavernous sinus, is extremely much more difficult than, than a schwannoma of whatever size. The schwannoma, the attachment is much less. The involvement of the vessels are much less. So, as a rule, a petroclival meningioma is a little more difficult, a little more risky, producing a problem, of course, somebody who is doing both because this is something which is, which is my area of practice. I mean, I, I, I have about a thousand acoustics now and I have about 180 petroclival meningioma. But any day, it's all depends on the, the pile bridge and the vessel involvement. That actually dictates your management. I saw big tumors, but I could take it out without damaging patient because there was no pile bridge. Now, of course, you need meticulous dissection, but when there is no adventitial invol in, in involvement, like what happens in meningioma, which does not happen in acoustics, uh, so the petroclival meningioma groups uh, <clears throat> compare, it is more difficult. Uh, Swanoma is, is something which is much less uh, difficult to take it out completely, but facial nerve preservation sometimes uh, may be equally difficult in both. I don't know that I have answered your question, but I think you don't side by side. I can't say it all depends on where is it. That's much more important. Where is the attachment? Now a petroclival meningioma going into all the foraminas. 
I can't exactly, I can never re remove it completely, totally, uh, Simpson grade one without any education. Whereas a tumor of six centimeter side acoustic going into the internal artery canal, I can remove completely uh, with a completely normal person. The quite crucial uh, answer, uh, Dr. Mr. Uh, there is a, a question to Dr. Jeans. Uh, if there is any intraoperative complication during the surgery, when you approach with the VR. So, so are there any intraoperative complications when using the VR? And how, and how do you deal with it? If you uh, do have complication with the VR, and how do you deal with it if it occurs? Just, just as Professor Misra was saying, you, you, you have to know how, how to do the operation without it. You, you can't be completely dependent on it such that you have to stop the operation. So if the VR somehow uh, breaks, okay, somehow stops working, you have to be able to achieve your surgical goal without it. Uh, you may have to rely on conventional navigation or other means or anatomical learning and whatnot. Fortunately, I have not had that experience, but... You, you, Again, to, to re-emphasize his point is th this is a tool, uh, but you have to be able to, uh, you have to plan for it not to be there uh, and be able to do the operation and complete the goal, surgical goal without, without that, that, that tool. Uh, it, you cannot be so dependent on it that you cannot achieve the goal with, with it, if it does break. Fortunately, that hasn't happened. You know, they just add on to that, like Professor Lars Lexel, very <laughs> nice saying, a tool with a, a fool with a tool is still a fool. <laughs> right. So it's a tool. That's appropriate. That's the absolute appropriate, uh, you know, conclusion of Dr. Jean's talk. You know, it makes you better. You, if you are a useless surgeon, you can't become a better surgeon with this tool. But if you're a good surgeon, it makes you a better surgeon. That's what I, I would say that way. The man behind the tool is the most important, right? Yeah, Absolutely. Right. Yes, uh, Dr. Nasser, do you have any questions? You're Dr. muted. Dr. Nasser? I'm mute. Do Dr. Nasser? Omar, I'm asking if anybody would like to say any comments or any questions before I close the <laughs> webinar. I would just... Um, I just uh, want Hashem. to say again, thank you, Nasser, my friend. I just, again, how much work you are doing in the pandemic. I mean, you were doing much more <laughs> education activities in the pandemic than you we see. ever had so many activities. So thank you again, my friend. I mean, you are doing a tremendous service for the world community of neurosurgeon. We are grateful to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Basant. Uh, actually, without your contribution and without your support, uh, as my friend and my brother, I wouldn't achieve anything, actually. And you are always behind us, Basant Misra, and you came to Egypt many times. You're supporting young Egyptian neurosurgeons and young African neurosurgeons. You are doing a great job. And we are following what you are doing, really. And we are trying to work as much as we can. I think we just have a last comment from Hisham Basuni, and then I will close the webinar. Hisham? Yeah, thank you very much for these uh, very stimulating presentations. And um, I just uh, one comment to, to this uh, very minimal invasive um, and very limited approaches. Um, I like them. <laughs> so uh, I have to put this uh, before um, some, some comments. But uh, for example, in aneurysms, um, for ex uh, you, you showed one uh, child with a very large arachnoid cyst, uh, Professor Ali. And I actually, I would have approached this from the Richter uh, sigmoid uh, because also one basic concept is uh, that you have to be very near to the pathology. And this is one of the concepts of the skull base surgery uh, to approach the, uh, to, to make your, your lesion nearer to you. So the nearest one is from Richter sigmoid, uh, in my opinion. Uh, the second thing is um, in aneurysms. Um, in tumors, it's uh, not such a problem, but um, in aneurysms, you have, uh, in this very limited approach, uh, you have one trajectory. Uh, so you have a very limited uh, view on the, patho on, on the aneurysm. Uh, so you cannot, of course, you can use the endoscope to look around, this is one method. But the problem rises if, of course, you showed a case where there was no subarachnoid hemorrhage. 
but the problem rises when the aneurysm ruptures. Uh, and uh, I think everybody who uh, uses these approaches have uh, a bad experience also. I had actually. Um, so I think in aneurysms, I would prefer a larger approach <coughs> to handle uh, any a rupture communication. Because if it ruptures, uh, your view is closed, closed, and also your space, which was formerly wide to, to, to clip the aneurysm, uh, closes suddenly because of the raised uh, um, pressure. So you cannot, uh, you, you are armless at this, that moment to handle the situation. So um, I switched, uh, for example, in the mini pleural, I had a very uh, bad experience. I switched, I'm very selectively uh, choosing the patients who I'm doing the mini uh, uh, um, or uh, the, the supraorbital approach. Uh, but uh, in case of doubt, if I have got any doubt, um, I'm, I'm choosing the larger approach to have many trajectories also to handle the aneurysm and clip it properly and also to handle any intraoperative uh, rupture complication. So this is one comment uh, um, to the educational webinar. Okay, thank you, Dr. Hisham, uh, Professor Hisham. Regarding the child, which is four years, actually the, the arachnoid is infratentorial. It's, it's uh, anterior, the brain stem, cerebral, cerebral, also in the third ventricle middle fossa and in the third ventricle. So in that, you, if I go through a retromastoid, I will not the, reach the supra part one, which is I have to open the third ventricle. But it's from this approach, you can go to the third ventricle. Uh, somebody hearing me? Yes, yes, I hear you. Yeah. Here. Uh, uh, you can go to the third ventricle. You can open the lamina terminalis from there. You can go for the, from the direction, you go to the uh, downward, you can open uh, you, the, the, the uh, infratentorial <coughs> part, you go cerebellar, you that. And that is a way we follow it actually, both of MRI and also CT scan later on, and everything is working very well. Actually, that is mm. someone they ask why not to do it from, as you said, retromastoid. But it's, you cannot reach the third ventricle from there. So you have to go in a brush. You can tackle the, the upper part and the lower part. This is the one. Uh, regarding the aneurysm, actually, I, we, have, we uh, operate in uh, some of uh, the already ruptured aneurysm and the same approach. Uh, actually, if there is a bleed, the bleed is not an important issue. The moment there is a bleed, OK. <clears throat> a cotinoid, you put it over the bleed and that everything will be stopped. So you'll use, you know, I am not believing in many hands in the surgical field. I believe on, a, you know, a gentle hand with, without affecting the other structure because sometimes, you know, the complication, morbidity or mortality is because of the overcome and, uh, you know, uh, and, uh, uh, Worrying about the bleed. The, the bleeding itself is not an important issue. I think this can be controlled and it's easy. You can even you move the microscope far away. You can reach to the internal carotid artery on the other side. You can see M, uh, A1 on the other side. You can go also from your side. It's an easy. Actually, if someone is practicing it, it's, it is an easy. Okay. I, well, I, I had. Uh... With this, uh, uh, you you will you will get the case where it ruptures and where you are in a very big trouble. Oh, I'm I, sure had, I, had. This. I had, I had, my dear, I had. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, it's time to close the webinar. At the end of this uh, important session, I would like to thank our distinguished speakers, uh, Professor Basant Misra, Professor Ali Al Mashani. Professor Walter Jeans and Professor James Evans. I would like to thank Professors Hisham Basuni and Omar Youssef. I would like to thank uh, Muhammad al Nokali for helping me in organization of this webinar. I would like to thank my organizing team, Dr. Ahmad Adel, Dr. Mustafa Abu Lil, 
Hassan Ali, Mr. Ahmed Magdi, IT. And I would like to thank all attendees. The discussion was great and the talks uh, were very impressive. Uh, and uh, I would like to thank all of you. As I announced next Friday at the same time, 2 p.m. Egypt time. This will be webinar 37, cerebrovascular. We have six eminent speakers. Professor Jack Moros, Alan Taylor, Ahmed Ammar, Ahmed Hagazi, Amir Khorashi, and maybe Thayoub from Senegal. Thank you very much for attendance. Thank you very much for contribution. Yeah. And see you next Friday. Thank, thank you, all of you. Thank, thank, you. thank, thank you. Thank you, all of you. Happy Friday, thank you. everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, you very much. You. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you.